Well, welcome everybody. Good morning. And we are delighted to have you with us. Uh, thanks to those of you who are in this area, and thanks especially to those who came in from elsewhere, uh, including all of our panelists and guests who came, for the most part, from D.C. and other regions outside Charlottesville. We welcome guests to Charlottesville, except in a particular category that I don't want to mention, <laughs> left over from August. <laughs> We're just talking with former Senator By, and he says, God, I keep getting these emails, you know, from a Jewish parents or other people saying, is it really safe for my son or daughter to go there? They weren't from here. There were two people connected to Charlottesville, and one of them lives in D.C. So, you know, really, it's okay. Please spread the word that Charlottesville is just as terrific as it's always been, and uh, it's a free society, so you can't limit people coming in and out, even if you don't like them, which we intensely do not in that one category. Well, look, welcome to the 19th Annual American Democracy uh, Conference. It's, it's a good time to have a conference, I suppose, on democracy or politics generally. Uh, over the last year, I think we could all agree, whatever our political perspectives, that every day has been a dog year. I uh, don't recall a, a time, uh, at least in my lifetime, maybe the late 60s, early 70s, when every day had so many developments and controversies, dare I say tweets, and all the other things. Uh, so it's, it's an incredible time, and we'll be discussing all of this throughout the day. Uh, we know how divisive the 2016 campaign was. Last year, we had this conference in Washington, and next year, because it's our 20th, we'll probably be having it in D.C. as well and with the celebration, because some of us are getting to the age where we may not, may not make it to the 30th or even the 25th, so we're going to make a big deal out of the 20th. Um, but uh, we had uh, as our main speaker Kellyanne Conway last year, and this was after the election. We thought it was appropriate since Trump was going to be president, and we found out from our audience especially the high school students who were there, just how divisive the Trump presidency was really likely to be. And it has lived up um, to its billing. I just was sent a study that I want to share with you because it relates to Thanksgiving next Thursday. This is really a well-done stu uh, well, well study out of uh, Stanford. And it turns out, <clears throat> and they have elaborate statistical models and they've worked this thing backwards and forwards, and after the 2016 election, at that Thanksgiving, on average, American families spent 20 to 30 minutes less with friends and family. That's on average. It's because there were so many conflicts and so many arguments. Either they wanted to avoid them and they arranged something else for Thanksgiving or they left early <laughs> or somebody else left early. Uh, that, that's really, and this added up, I was stunned by this figure, 27 million fewer hours of Thanksgiving discourse with family and friends. Well, think what it's going to be this year. If it was that much last year before anything had actually happened, one can only imagine what, what will occur this year, which is not a good thing, or, well, depending on your family, I guess it could be. Um, but we hope to help repair a little bit of that, tiny little bit of that today. So for 19 years, this conference has assembled top political insiders, pollsters, journalists, party representatives, and a wide range of behind-the-scenes strategists to discuss the most recent elections, but mainly, I think, to look forward to the next set of elections, because predictions about what's already happened tend to be 100% accurate. We're more interested in getting people to think ahead, to be bold, and to be wrong. Uh, and so we tried to set the, we, we blazed a trail after 2016, as far as that's concerned, uh, along with all of our colleagues. So we are going to discuss the, the politics of all of this, and we invite your participation. Um, 2017 should hypothetically be the sleepiest of the four years that make up the election cycle, but that clearly hasn't been the case this year. We've been tracking those races and the 2018 races for Senate and House and Governor in our Crystal Ball newsletter and our two great people, Managing Editor and Associate Editor, Kyle Kondik and Jeff Skelly, will be heading up the first two panels, starting with, with Jeff. Um, we have a, a new issue out this morning. I hope you're all subscribing. If the price is right. It's free. You know, you, you can't get that as your excuse. All you have to do is plug in an email. You know, it's 
That's, that's not too much trouble, I hope. So you should all be subscribing and tell your friends and family if they're not, if they are coming to Thanksgiving. You know, go ahead and tell them about the crystal ball. Maybe that can bring you together. Now, to this morning, we, um, it may be preposterous to all of us to suggest that a Democrat could actually win a Senate seat in Alabama. But because of what's going on there, and I'm sure the panels will discuss this, the Democrat, as of today, the election's December 12th, plenty of time for it to change. But assuming Roy Moore stays on the ballot, the Democrat is actually slightly favored now, which I really don't believe, but that's what everybody who knows politics in Alabama is telling us, and it's what those awful polls that we no longer refer to as much are also saying. So it, it would be amazing and incredible, and for the Republicans, stupid, if that actually happened, and it, and it might. So we did suggest that this morning, and then uh, we also uh, lowered the rating a little bit in Tennessee where former Governor Phil Bredesen may take on the, the Senate seat being vacated by Bob Corker, who of late is a Trump critic, and he's a strong candidate. We don't, you know, it's a Republican state now. It would be tough for him to win, but it's not impossible. If there's a wave like we saw in Virginia last Tuesday, it was, that was clearly a wave. You don't have all of these, pardon me, anonymous people uh, being elected to the House of Delegates without a wave. And we haven't seen a wave like that in a long time in Virginia. We've seen it nationally in some elections, but not here. And then for the Republican constituents, we did it because it was true, but we wanted to give them something. We've lowered the Senate race in Florida uh, to um, a toss-up. Uh, Senator Bill Nelson, who's a UVA law graduate, so we hated doing this to him, but we did. Uh, because it's Jeff and Kyle who are soulless. They just don't care. They're tough, they're cold, and they'll do it to anybody. You know, and I, wor I worry about these things, but I let them take the lead because emotion shouldn't be part of this. So that's, that's down to toss up because Governor Rick Scott will be running. In any event, the first panel will go into all this in much more detail and talk about the battle for the Senate and other races next year. And we're so pleased that you're with us or watching via live stream, which is ongoing right now. And for those of you who like to tweet and Democrats, Republicans, and independents today seem to like to tweet. Our hashtag is uh, 2017 ADC, ADC, American Dem Democracy Conference, 2017 ADC. So add that to any tweet that you send out about this conference, at least the ones that are positive. The negative tweets, you either don't send them or you misidentify them so they can never be traced. That's all I ask, okay? Now, let me call up our associate editor of the Crystal Ball, Jeff Skelly, to get us started and to introduce his panelists. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's awake. I'm not. Uh, I'm not really a morning person, but uh, I'm going to really you know, strive to get through this, and we're going to try to talk about the 2018 midterm election. Uh, but first, we are going to talk a little bit about Alabama, because uh, I think that's sort of a, you know, unavoidable topic at the moment. Uh, and as my panel gets seated here, um, I'm going to start introducing them. So uh, first here on my left, um, by the way, I just want to make it clear, these are uh, not the full introductions, because if I were to do the full introductions, we'd be here for 15 minutes. Uh, every one of these individuals is very accomplished, and there are a lot more things that they've done that I'm going to list off here. Uh, but first, I'm going to start on the left, uh, or excuse me, my immediate left, uh, with Senator Evan Bayh, um, who was a former two-term uh, Democratic senator from the, the great state of Indiana, and uh, also was a two-term governor prior to that, uh, and also served as Secretary of State there. So he's won a number of elected offices. Uh, today, he is a partner at McGuire Woods, uh, and he also serves as a senior advisor and a member of the boards of directors uh, for a number of major firms. Uh, and importantly, we should note that he is a Wahoo having graduated from the University of School of Law in 1981, so wahoo wah. Uh, to his left is David Byler, who is a staff writer and chief elections uh, analyst for the Weekly Standard. Uh, and prior to that, he was an elections analyst uh, for Real Clear Politics. Um, and much to his chagrin, uh, David graduated from Princeton University. Uh, that, that's the last of my, my jokes about education for the day. To his left is Jerry Ann Henry, who is the Senior Associate Director at uh, APCO Worldwide, 
a public relations and communications agency in Washington, D.C. Uh, prior to APCO, uh, Jerry Ann was president of Convergence Communications, where she served as an advocate and campaign manager for nonprofits. Uh, to her left is Henry Olson, who is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, uh, and he studies and provides commentary on American politics. Uh, his latest book, which just came out in June, is The Working Class Republican, Ronald Reagan and the Return of Blue Collar Conservatism. Uh, I have not had the pleasure of reading it yet, but I have been told by my colleague Kyle Condick that it is quite excellent, and I'm not surprised by that. Um, Henry previously served as Vice President and Director of the National Research in Institu Initiative excuse me, at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, and finally, uh, at the far end of the panel from me, uh, is Evan Siegfried, who is a political strategist and commentator. And uh, he serves as president of Sum Consulting, a public affairs firm. Uh, and his debut book, which came out uh, in August of 2016, is GOP GPS, How to Find the Millennials and Urban Voters the Republican Party Needs to Survive. Uh, so having introduced my panel, I'm going to just start out with uh, uh, sort of a, a basic question, and I'm going to get their responses to it. And we'll start with, with Senator Evan Bayh. And basically, the question is, given the election results last Tuesday and what's going on in Alabama, uh, how panicked should Republicans be based on those election results? And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll start with Senator Bayh. Well, thank you, uh, particularly for your gracious introduction. It uh, started to sound a little bit like a eulogy there for a moment, so I'm, <laughs> I'm relieved. And it's great to be back in Charlottesville uh, on the grounds and such a great uh, university and with all of you. So I think before the I think they should have been concerned before the election for a number of reasons and I think they should be even more concerned uh, after the election. So I'd say on a scale of 1 to 10 with, you know, 10 being kind of uh, end of days, uh, they're, you know, probably about an 8. Uh, if you look at uh, if you look at history, midterm elections tend to be pretty tough on the party of the president. And under these circumstances, they may be even tougher. And Virginia might have been a harbinger of that. Uh, the president's job approval rating is anywhere from 38 to 42 or 3 percent, historically fairly low. Although Americans are feeling you know, fairly good about their own personal economic situation, when you ask them about the direction of the country, by 20-some percent, they think the country is heading in the wrong direction. Uh, people are still as angry as they were a year ago about the, the establishment, the status quo, the elites. Uh, Congress's job approval rating is still 16, 18 percent. Uh, you know, by the time the Obamacare replace and repeal effort got done, uh, you know, that was sort of a shambles. The tax bill is more popular, but it's trending in a little less popular direction. So you kind of net all this out. The, the, the thing that the Republicans have going for them, however, and it may save them at the end of the day, are the maps. Just remember, maps, maps, maps. Uh, this is going to be roughly correct. Hillary Clinton got about 2.8 million more popular votes last year than Donald Trump. But Donald Trump, I think, won 28 more congressional districts. So just think how the maps are drawn in a way that may be the ultimate firewall for the Republicans, although they're going to lose some seats over this tax bill with the change in the deductibility of state um, and local taxes, particularly in some of those suburban districts in New Jersey, New York, uh, California. So, But the maps really do favor the Republicans. And in the Senate as well, putting Alabama aside, there are seven Senate seats that may be competitive, five, five are in states that Donald Trump carried by at least, at least 19 percent. So those are five Democratic incumbents running in very red states. And that may test just how tribal our politics have become. Uh, Arizona and Nevada are the two uh, seats held by uh, Republicans. I think it's probably more likely than not the Democrats will pick up both of those. But the Democrats have to run the table in order to even get to 50-50, if they picked up all seven of those seats and Alabama, that would get them to 51-49. So it's a, a map. It's an uphill struggle for the Democrats. So to get back to your question, but one final thing that helps the Republicans, in midterm elections, the electorate tends to be older and it tends to be whiter. And that uh, tends to be more favorable to the Republican Party. So you net it all out. I think it's going to be, as we sit here today, about a year out, a very good uh, election for the Democrats whether it's the kind of wave that Larry was referring to that allows them to sweep all of the Senate races and enough to just get across the threshold in the House remains to be seen. I think today they'll get close, but not quite. If the economy were to deteriorate for any reason, then you've got a wave, and the Democrats might take both. But the maps still favor the Republicans. So an 8 out of 10. 
Yeah, um, well, I also want to say thanks to the University of Virginia for having all of us here. And I agree with the senator that an eight is about the right number. The way that I think about this is that uh, eight's the right number, but it should have been an eight before Virginia. Adding that piece of information, I don't think should change your estimation of what the midterms are going to look like. If you look at all the various indicators of what the midterms might look like. You look at presidential approval, Trump has a very low rating. You look at the generic ballot polls, which on average favor Democrats by about 10 points. You look at congressional retirements, you look at special elections and how Democrats are performing uh, compared to their baseline in 2016 or whenever the last election they had was. Uh, you end up with all the indicators sort of pointing in the same direction. Um, I think the center is correct about the maps, um, but my view is that at some point there's enough of a vote advantage that it does overcome the maps. In 2006, if I recall correctly, Democrats won the House popular vote by eight. And the fact that they're up by 10 now and that historically, I mean, this isn't a law of physics, but historically the generic ballot polls tend to move against the party in power. So they tend to move towards the Democrats. It's all kind of adding up in the same direction. So I would say eight is roughly the right estimate here. Well, thank you guys for having me here. And I'm going to have to be the curmudgeon and be different. I'll say 7.9, just so it's <laughs> not, so I don't say eight again. Um, but, and I think it's everything that has been highlighted here. Um, but I would agree that it's before the election, that concern uh, that Republicans should face was there. And it's not just because of the maps and it's not just because of the electorate numbers that we saw. I think what we're also seeing is a lot of confusion within campaign, with in the campaigns and with strategists trying to figure out who it is that they need to be talking to and how they need to be talking to them. And I think that the Virginia election uh, showcased a lot of that. Um, you saw different um, uh, appeals being made to different groups. And the analysis since then, which quickly got overshadowed by Alabama, we were all discussing that, but um, the analysis after that also showed that confusion. If you look back historically, there were uh, uh, measures that Republicans needed to take that they had documented in 2012 after uh, Romney lost the election in the, uh, what we like to call the autopsy. Um, and, and then we had this, this last election came along and everybody was trying to look at who is this new base that we need to reach out to. And I think that one of the underestimations that they made that has been made since then is um, how much of a drag Hillary was on Democratic votes. Um, that drag propelled somebody like Trump forward maybe more than Trump himself propelled himself forward. She pulled a lot of votes. If you go back and look at the numbers, uh, uh, Mitt Romney won, Mich won more votes in Michigan than uh, Donald Trump did, but he still lost the state. Um, and you can see some of those, those uh, numbers play out. So in Virginia, without Hillary on the ticket and in a few other districts, you suddenly saw Democrats coming out and making, uh, make, voting the same way they would have if we'd continued projecting and predicting from 2012 votes and earlier. So I think that uh, Republicans need to uh, be very stressed about uh, not just the numbers and the maps, but really looking at what sort of strategy they want to use what has worked and what hasn't, and not let themselves be caught up in um, some of the chaos that uh, Twitter and uh, armchair quarter quarterbacks can make. Yeah, I'll put myself uh, out on the limb here. I'll say 8.1. Um, <laughs> but I want to put some numbers behind this. I run a group called the Voter Study Group, which puts together 20 people from uh, far left to far right, and we agree on a uniform set of questions, and we field massive polls. Uh, that ask between five and 8,000 people. And there are also longitudinal polls. So these are the same people who took similar questionnaires back in 2011. So we're the only group in the country that has the data that allows us to identify who actually were Clinton, Obama voters, who actually were Obama, Trump voters, and so forth. And what our July survey showed when we asked a generic ballot question was the following. If you were an Obama, Clinton voter, you're most certainly gonna vote for a Democrat. If you were a Republican Trump voter, you're almost certainly going to vote for a Republican. Nothing in the 2017 elections suggested that that has changed. The groups that will decide whether it's a wave or not are the groups in the middle. The people who voted for Romney and then voted for Clinton, our poll showed were overwhelmingly likely to vote for a Democrat. Now, that was not true in the 2016 congressional elections, that 
person after person won re-election in districts that were carried by hillary clinton because the romney clinton voter voted for the republican in twenty seventeen fourteen of the fifteen seats that the democrats picked up in the state house were in clinton carried house districts they did not only picked up one seat that trump carried and that was a forty seven forty six seat that trump carried what that showed is what we've been seeing in races throughout the country in this year, which is that the person who was a traditional Republican, the person who voted for W. Bush in 04 and McCain in 08 and Romney in 12, but Clinton in 16, is now a Democrat. That person voted Democratic up and down the ticket in Virginia. They did the same in judicial races and local races in Chester County, which is another highly educated area that flipped. This is a warning sign and a terrible sign for Republicans, particularly in the House and in the gubernatorial races. But the flip side is the Obama-Trump voter. The Obama-Trump voter remains less motivated to vote, and you saw that in 2017, is that their share of the vote in Virginia was slightly down a little bit, but they remain committed to voting for the Republicans if they do vote. And so what that tells me is that the House is in real trouble because the Democrats need 24 seats to win the House, 23 seats were carried by Hillary Clinton. What it tells me is that Republicans running for governor are in real trouble because they hold 12 seats that were either, 12 states that were either Obama twice and Clinton or Obama twice and Trump. And the fall off among the Clinton, the Romney Clinton voters suggests that a lot of those seats are in trouble. But what it suggests to me is that the Senate may be the Republican firewall, precisely for the reason that Senator Bai outlined. And by looking at these groups over the next year, you'll be able to really accurately predict who falls and who doesn't. And I think the Republicans are in really bad shape, but not death-like shape, particularly in the Senate. Well, I've always seen that in chaos, you should find opportunity, which is why, after speaking to every friend of mine who's an operative in the Republican Party, I bought shares in every medical company I could that produces prescription drugs for anxiety. Uh, <laughs> since then, Republicans have been getting more and more Valium to deal with what I think is going to be a nine on the panic level for Ooh. 2018. Uh, when I started looking at what are we going to do as a Republican Party especially keep the House, we really don't have much. We have just a lot of people very worried about what's going on. We have no real message at this point. We have a party that's in the middle of a civil war about the direction of it. There's sort of the Breitbart band wing of the party that is all consuming, and that, I would say, has overtaken the Trump wing because we saw in the Alabama Senate primary Trump endorsed Luther Strange, but he had no ability to get Luther Strange over the finish line, and it was Roy Moore. That mindset and mentality is the primary thing, not so much Donald Trump. At the same time, there's a loosely cobbled together coalition of Republicans, such as myself and the neoconservatives, the more social conservatives who are trying to say, well, this is the direction we want the party to go in. So you're going to have each candidate in each House race trying to push their own narrative. At the same time, Democrats, while we do like to say as Republicans uh, the snarky Dems in disarray comment, Yes, the Democratic National Committee is in disarray, but then look at the DCCC, the DSCC, and how much money they're raising. Then go look at the candidates themselves. At no point in history have we seen an opposition party like the Democrats with so many candidates having raised already, I think it was in the first half of 2017, they had already raised, uh, or there had been over 50 candidates who had raised more than $5,000. That's unheard of. And I start getting worried. And then I started looking at what happened last Tuesday, and I saw it wasn't so much the party apparatus that helped bring these Democratic candidates, not only in Virginia and New Jersey across the finish line, but in places like New York. We had some regional races. It was the uh, groundwork and the grassroots apparatus. They're self-organizing. They are fired up and ready to go, to borrow a line from some guy who got elected president before Donald Trump. Uh, but there were two races in particular that really worried me. The first was the Westchester County Executives race, a man named Rob Astorino, who was first elected in 2009 and re-elected in 2013. He ran for governor against Andrew Cuomo and outperformed what he should have in upstate New York and gave Andrew Cuomo a much closer race in 2014. He was up for re-election as Westchester County Executive. And with a week to go, Robert Mercer poured a million dollars into his campaign, which is unheard of for that race. And he lost by 10 points and he was going to run for governor uh, next year. And then there was the Hempstead Town Supervisor in Nassau County in Long Island. 
And since the office was created in 1917, it has always been held by a Republican. Anthony Santino, the town supervisor, got thrown out for a Democrat. Never happened before. So when I start seeing that, yeah, I'm buying Pfizer. <laughs> Well, I think this is a, a good chance to transition into uh, talking about the Senate first, and then we'll talk about the House. And you know, the thing that's on everyone's mind at the moment uh, on the Senate side is clearly what's happening in Alabama. Uh, events are still moving. We don't really know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but as, as uh, Larry mentioned earlier, we just shifted our rating there to Leans Democratic, which I, are words I can't believe I'm actually saying. Um, and so I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts about what's happening there. Um, do you think Moore can pull it out? Do you think, I mean, it looks like Alabama Republicans are probably going to stick by Moore. Um, and I just sort of want, you know, any thoughts you guys might have on the, the chaos in Alabama. And we can start with Senator By. Well, chaos is the right word, and it's difficult to predict because every day brings new revelations, accusations, however you want to uh, characterize them. So I, uh, I get back to what I said at the beginning. Th this is going to test just how tribal our politics has become. Uh, our president famously said during the last election he could go out and shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and his base would still stay with him. Uh, is that going to be the case for Roy Moore in Alabama as well? Uh, he was a historically weak candidate to begin with uh, and has underperformed in Alabama. But these races, and people sometimes analogize to uh, a race in Louisiana with uh, David Vitter who was a sitting senator, ran for governor. It turned out that he had been uh, involved with some prostitutes, and so that was uh, uh, very damaging to him. And he went on to lose the governor's race in Alabama, in Louisiana, by 10 points. But there's a difference between governor's races and Senate races and races for the House of Representatives that have become increasingly parliamentary. There's a, a liberal party and a, a conservative party, and people tend to stick with their parties. Uh, I think the, the point about all the money that's being raised is a, a good one. But after the blizzard of ads, people end up saying, I don't like any of them, I don't know who to believe, and so I'm just going to stick with my tribe. And so I would take with a grain of salt, the last thing I'd say is, just as the polls were all wrong about the Trump-Clinton race for a variety of reasons, I would take with a little grain of salt these polls out of Alabama. There are probably a, some voters there who are reluctant to say to a pollster that they're supporting Roy Moore, but they end up, may end up voting Roy Moore because they just can't bring themselves to vote for a Democrat who's pro-women's uh, right to choose and is in favor of some gun restrictions and is going to vote against the kind of Supreme Court and other uh, judicial nominees that the Republican Party would be for. So my guess is it's 50-50 with a, this is just a guess, could change tomorrow, 50-50 with still a slight edge for the Republican just because of how tribal uh, our, our politics has become. And the last thing I'd mention is that I think a majority of Alabama voters, more than 50 percent, uh, and this is a state Trump carried by 25, a majority of Alabama voters are white evangelicals. And so they will be particularly difficult. You wouldn't think intuitively, given the nature of some of the allegations, this might be the case. Mm -hmm. But they tend to kind of vote down the line uh, pretty much, too. So they'll be hard to peel away from a Republican, even if he is Roy Moore. Yeah, so I still think of this race as a toss-up. There's a couple reasons for that. One is the polling. Right now, the Real Clear Politics average has Roy Moore up by three points, uh, at least as of when I was checking it in the green room over there. Um, and there's some uncertainty around that estimate. Um, a lot of people who know about polls know that there's random error and that you only sample some small part of the population. So you get some sampling error and things like that. But there's also error in what choices pollsters choose to make. Uh, these survey researchers are all trying to figure out what the electorate's going to look like, how many Trump supporters are going to show up, what the demographics are going to look like, things along those lines. And really reasonable choices in different directions about that can lead to different estimates. So the fact that the average is close, I think, puts it in sort of toss-up territory. Um, like Jeff was saying, this is kind of an amazing race. I was thinking through it and reading what uh, uh, was published on Sabado's Crystal Ball this morning about the race going from toss-up to leans Democratic, and I was thinking, maybe I still have it as a toss-up, but 
wow, we're talking about toss-up versus leans Democratic in Alabama. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, Donald Trump got 62.1% of the vote in this state. This is not a state that typically elects Democrats. It's been decades since it elected a Democrat to the Senate. Uh, and yeah, so the other thing to keep in mind in terms of assessing this race is thinking about Roy Moore in this context. If you look at his uh, 2012 run when he was uh, down ballot for the Supreme Court seat and you compare his showing to Mitt Romney's, there was a big drop off. Alabamans, uh, Alabamians, sorry, uh, started off sort of with a much lower opinion of Roy Moore than they would have for a generic Republican. And so, yeah, this has room to get worse for him. Yeah, I would. I agree with a, a bit of what's been said here. I think the tribalism, as you called it, and I would say just um, the chaos of the race is going to have more of an impact than people may think. Uh, right now, everybody is so inundated, not just in this race, but it happened here in Virginia with the attacks on all sides, that there's. An, it is very easy to just shut down and ignore so much of that. And I think it's important to remember that this election is not happening next Tuesday. We still have some time to go. Uh, Roy Moore already had made himself into a firebrand who was going to be attacked, and it already had become an us versus them long before any of these allegations came out. During uh, the primary, when it was him versus Luther Strange, they both battled it out hard, and people have already decided to let those things, uh, let those things pass. His supporters already have made that decision. Continuing to make that decision from now till election day is not going to be a huge step for them. So the chaos of the day, the, the Twitter polls, if you will, may make that something that, um, that uh, looks like it leans more towards him, but I still see this as Alabama. And I think uh, for uh, opponents of Roy Moore, there's a need to be cautious that they don't actually drive more support towards him by people buckling down and digging their heels in and saying, no, this is our guy, and this is just another case of uh, Washington, D.C. and Mitch McConnell trying to take out our guy. Because um, every, everything right now, the accusations have been called a lie. The reasons, the, the, the reasons that they might be lies have now been called lies, and the lies about the lies have been just brief. So nobody knows what to believe. I could go on. Um, I, to me, I was on the plane last night, and I was looking at my Twitter feed, which is increasingly a source of humor and dismay simultaneously. And I saw Roy Moore's latest tweet was, Senator McConnell, bring it on. To which Twitter immediately exploded by noting that that was the title of a movie about high school cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with everything that Senator Bai said I would just ask you to look at two things as you're evaluating the polls, uh, because as David said, one of the things that you need to do is not just look at the, what we call the top lines, but you need to look at what we call the cross tabs. You need to look at who's being surveyed and what the subgroups are saying. Alabama is incredibly racially polarized. Every 1% of an underestimate of the African American population basically shifts the margin towards Roy Moore by 1%. How many African Americans will turn out? In 2012, they had President Obama to turn them out, and Roy Moore still 151 to 48. Every small decline in African American turnout increases the chance of him winning. Secondly, uh, we know that from that past race where Moore won only, I think it was 51 48, David? I think that's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we already know that, based on past results, that about 20% of people who voted for Donald Trump dislike. Roy Moore so much, even if they're Republican, that they would either vote for a Democrat or sit out of the race. The question is, does this move the extra 5%? Do you go from about 20% uh, 20 of normally Republican voters who are going to switch to Moore to around the 25 to 30%? That'll come almost exclusively among whites. It'll come almost exclusively in higher educated areas. And a poll that catches those sort of movements, I'll take as being more serious than a poll that doesn't catch those movements but has a more eye-catching top line. I think that the really interesting thing that came out was there was a JMC analytics poll that came out on Saturday or Sunday that said the accusations against Roy Moore made 28% of the electorate more likely to vote for him. And I think that's because we have been having this scapegoat uh, mentality 
in the Republican Party, the fake news, the us versus them mentality. And I think it goes to that tribalism that was described by Jerry and others, where we are telling our base as a party, if you hear some news that you don't like, it's not real. It doesn't matter what facts are. It, it's more an opinion-based uh, feeling. And at the same time, we are seeing where the Republican brand is heavily damaged across the country, and it coincides with Donald Trump because he is the prism in which we are viewed as a party. I saw in that same poll that millennials, who are the group that detest Donald Trump most consistently to the point that his disapproval ratings nationally are 67 percent to upwards of 74 percent in every poll, Donald Trump's approval rating among millennials in the JMC poll was 63 percent. So it was a complete flip from the rest of the millennial generation. I think that actually works toward Roy Moore's advantage. And the other thing that works toward Roy Moore's advantage is that voters are still angry at Washington. They've been angry in 2010 at Democrats in power. They were angry in 2012, 2014, 2016 especially. And their way of sending a message to Washington was by electing Donald Trump, and now it's going to be by voting for Roy Moore. What he was accused of was despicable, but a lot of people feel that sending that message is more important than the morals. They feel that Roy Moore and Donald Trump are their way of sticking their thumb in the eyes of the people that they feel have come every election cycle, overpromised and never delivered on every promise that they've come out with. So they are willing to sacrifice moral beliefs in an ability to get some sort of vengeance. And that worries me when you see voters who act like that. And I don't know at this point how you overcome that unless you turn out some new group to compensate for it. Uh, I, I was just going to make one last comment. So I'm going to quote Groucho Marx here who once said, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Uh, and the reason I mention that is, uh, you know, with your own eyes, you've seen the reaction of Mitch McConnell, who is one of the most astute politicians. I served with him for 12 years. and whatever else you think may think of the senator, he's pretty astute when it comes to politics. So when you see him come out so vigorously uh, and oppose Roy Moore, looking for a write-in candidate, and, and Moore's not going to drop out, the reason I'm mentioning all this is uh, Mitch cares about more than anything else having the majority. Yes, uh, Roy Moore would be a complete loose cannon and a total pain to deal with if he wins, but McConnell would, you know, in my estimation, put up with that to keep the majority. What that tells you when he comes out so vigorously uh, against Roy Moore is that the crystal ball may be right and what I told you may be wrong because it tells you that the data that Mitch McConnell is seeing shows that Moore may be a loser. Jerry, I was just going to add, it's, it's a, this is a more anecdotal point, but I think we've all touched on it and it's worth noting. In addition to the work mentioned in my um, bio, I am uh, the chair of the Young Republicans in uh, Alexandria and I spent a lot of time knocking on doors and talking to voters. And um, it is worth noting and can't be forgotten that the general opinion in Virginia, and I, from, I just came from Texas working with some voters there and I have family in Alabama, the general opinion of every politician is that they've probably all done everything that Roy Moore is accused of already. So revealing that doesn't change anybody's minds. We could go in and talk about things that we thought that Northam had done or anything and it didn't matter. The opinion is so low. If you have a title near your name and you've been in Washington, D.C., you're already as bad as any accusation that could be brought. So that may also have less clout than people expect. And I think that's worth noting when you look at this. It, it also should be noted that in the Breitbart universe, uh, privately with friends of mine who are in that uh, and talked to Steve Bannon, they've said to me, that they know Roy Moore is flawed, and this was before the accusations. They said, you know, he's a little bit of a schmuck, putting it lightly. Uh, but this is their way of sending a message to Mitch McConnell, the all-consuming obsession with the Breitbart orbit of getting Mitch McConnell is really hindering the growth of the party. But I think that is what you're going to have a lot of voters driving out there and saying, I want to tell Mitch McConnell, you're fired. Yeah. So. Let's turn to 2018 proper. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in Alabama. And I will mention that the, the last Democrat to win a Senate seat in Alabama was Richard Shelby. Um, he won re-election in 1992, but then he switched parties to become Republican in 1994. So it's been a while. Um, so if Doug Jones win, wins, it'll be pretty monumental. Um, so looking ahead to 2018 proper, 
Um, I think it's worth noting that, you know, Democrats are defending a ton of seats, 25 of the 33 that are scheduled to be up. And in the 26 midterm cycles from 1914 to 2014, 91% of incumbents from the party that's not in the White House have won re-election. Uh, so Democrats are defending a lot of seats, but there is a lot of evidence that uh, they, the party that's not in the White House tends to, to do all right, even when they are defending a lot of seats. Um, and so I was, you know, based on that percentage, that would roughly mean two or three uh, Democrats, uh, Democratic incumbents would lose. Now, of course, it could be more, it could be less, who knows, um, we'll just have to see. But I, I just wanted the panel's opinion on just who is the most vulnerable Democrat running for reelection and what are really the opportunities for Republicans? So the three I would keep uh, your eye on, there are five of them, as I mentioned, five incumbent Democrats running from states that Trump carried by at least 19%. Indiana was 19, Missouri was 19, West Virginia, I think, was 40. Uh, North Dakota and Montana were both close to 30. So if our politics has become really tribal, particularly with regard to federal races, this is uphill running for those five in incumbents. But I think in Montana and North Dakota, I think John Tester and Heidi Heitkamp will probably be okay because there are, these are, the populations of these states are so small that you can know, you know, most of your voters personally know you. And so that may enable them to kind of break through some of this just by dint of personal familiarity and the fact that it may be a good Democratic year and all that. So I would focus on the others. Uh, West Virginia, you know, Joe Manchin, if you were going to have a Democrat win in West Virginia, it would be Joe Manchin, popular former governor. Uh, you know, pro-coal, a number of other things, but 40% for Trump, that's uphill running. Uh, and then Missouri, uh, you know, Claire last time with the help of the uh, DSCC was able to play in the Republican primary and got a, you know, the, the opponent she wanted. Who knows who her opponent will be this time? Keep an eye on that. And then my home state of Indiana, where Joe Donnelly, I think Indiana's probably 50-50, uh, Joe Donnelly benefited from real divisions in the Republican Party last time, and a candidate who um, said that if a woman was impregnated by a rapist, it was God's will. Uh, so that was the end of uh, any suburban women voting for him. Uh, will that replicate itself? But on the other hand, uh, in our primary, we have a Republican primary. Two Republican congressmen are running against each other. If it happens to be uh, one of those Republican congressmen wins the primary, apropos of what was said earlier, you want, if you're a Democrat running in one of those states, you want a sitting member of Congress as your opponent, someone who's already in the swamp, who's not running to, you know, as a change agent, et cetera, et cetera. There's a third candidate in Indiana, a small businessman who's willing to put six, seven, eight million dollars of his own money into the race. If he happens to win, much more dangerous. So to directly answer your question, I'd look at West Virginia, uh, Indiana, and Missouri. But again, the, remember this, for the Democrats to get a majority in the Senate, they have to hold all five of those states all of them. They also have to win Arizona and Nevada, which I think we probably will. And then, in addition to all that, we have to pick up some other state, probably Alabama. If not Alabama, I ask you how likely is it that a Democrat will win Tennessee or Texas? So um, basically, to get to 51, the Democrats have to run the table. Yeah, so I kind of think about this in two ways. The first is to put the races into tiers based on how well known the various candidates are. And some of the recent polling helps with this. Uh, a polling firm called Morning Consult recently did a poll that gauged the approval rating of various senators, or all the senators, in their home states. And what they found was that uh, in Missouri and Indiana, uh, Claire McCaskill and Joe Donnelly, uh, respectively, still had a lot of voters who didn't know who they were and their favorability ratings were uh, under 50%. I would say that that's a little bit of a dangerous place because that potentially allows your opponent to define you, to, uh, like Senator Bice said, maybe say that you're part of you know, this Washington presence that a lot of voters in these states really don't like and have rebelled against. Um, what you notice when you move into the other states is that in North Dakota, Montana, and West Virginia, you still have senators who are better known and whose approval ratings are above 50%. Now, important caveat here, we're measuring these ratings before the campaign really gets underway, um, before ads go up that say things like, Senator Joe Manchin cast the deciding vote to save the Affordable Care Act. Things like that. So that's a little bit how I'd put the initial uh, 
assessment of candidates is that some of them have sort of a better, more established personal brand than others. So uh, Democrats, I would think, would be more worried about Indiana and Missouri. But in these Senate elections, and this is kind of the second way I think about it, uh, a lot depends on the national environment and national partisanship. You can see this when you look at historical data, when you see what predicts what in terms of what's helpful for projecting Senate results. The state level partisanship and what voters think of the president in that state really matters. So I built a simulator uh, when I was working at Real Clear Politics that took in uh, various scenarios for President Trump's approval rating and essentially spat out rough win probabilities for various senators. And if you have Trump in the sort of high 30s range, a lot of these Democrats are still able to keep their seats. Uh, Joe Manchin has an especially tough fight, given the lean of his state. But you start to see um, senators like uh, Tester and Heitkamp and these others still being able to win the majority of times. So, um, I mean, I think what everyone else has said about the map is true. It's definitely an uphill battle, and Democrats sort of have to do everything right to get to 50-50 or to take the chamber. But um, yeah, that's about where I'd put it. Well, I was thinking about this, and you know, there's only there's only so many seats to look at, so it can be fairly simple to just look at um, which ones are most likely to be defeated. I do agree. I think Claire McCaskill is the one that I, I honed in on. She actually had a pretty tough race before. I think that's um, Missouri has always been a little bit rough. Um, in the, well, in the last few years, it's been rough. Uh, Blunt even had a very rough time um, uh, in this last cycle. Uh, but there's another factor here that doesn't necessarily impact exactly which ones we're looking at right now. It's almost like we're in some sort of warp time zone where just the time from now to 2018 may be a much larger, <laughs> a much longer so timeline than we, <laughs> right, uh, at, at the pace that things change. And we need to bear that in mind. Uh, a concern that I have um, and that I think um, needs to be weighed into this is um, the number of members in the Senate and the House opting to not run for re-election. And I think there may be states, uh, and this is there, there may be a few places. I'm, I'd be hard pressed, you know. I don't see um, uh, Cornyn or, or um, <laughs> that many people dropping out. But you've got some other places. There, there are places where um, there could be some new states that open up, that could provide additional opportunities that haven't been looked at before, and that would throw things into chaos because you no longer have any incumbents, um, and uh, and it all you'd have to make a whole new simulator. <laughs> <laughs> well, we accounted for incumbency, so. I would take a look at uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, Missouri and Indiana, these are accidental senators. Yeah. That in both cases they were elected because of massive misstatements by the Republican nominee about abortion that convinced millions, or not millions, but you know, a large percentage of, uh, of women uh, who were less conservative Republicans to switch over. Assuming that that doesn't happen again, the fact that these are highly Republican states that have proven to be very partisan. In fact, in Missouri last time, you had a very attractive Democratic candidate, Jason Kander, who ran as a non-liberal Democrat. He still lost by three percentage points to somebody who I think can charitably be described as a uh, walking representative of the Republican establishment, Roy Blunt. Uh, so I, I would start by thinking that the Democrats are two seats down. And then you go back to the partisanship, which is, you know, that. Everything that we're seeing is that if you voted for Donald Trump in 2016, you are still highly likely to want to vote for Republicans. Now, I'm not saying that somebody like a tester or a Heitkamp camp can't or a mansion can't overcome that, but they have a huge uphill battle to do that. Sherrod Brown is running, and we haven't mentioned him yet. Uh, Trump won Ohio by eight percentage points, and Ohio was notable for being one of the very few states in the country where there was not a noticeable suburban movement among highly educated voters that most of every other major metropolitan area you saw highly educated voters moving towards Hillary Clinton. You didn't see that in Cincinnati or Cleveland. You did see it in Columbus, um, which again suggests that he might be somebody who's not on people's radar screens, but if Trump voters show up and vote, um, Sherrod Brown would basically have to get about 10 percent of Trump voters to switch over to survive in a narrow chance. So um, I do think Nevada is gone for the Republicans. It's now pretty much a Democratic state. Dean Heller's 
got a divided party. Uh, I think if Jerry Tarkanian were to beat him, he'd lose by even more. I think that's a net pickup. And Arizona is a toss-up, depending on the Republican nominee. But I think it's going to be very hard for the Democrats simply to hold even, given the tribalism that we have going. The last time we had this conflict between strong incumbents and a national trend was the 2014 elections, when Democratic strategists were telling us Republicans have only knocked off three or four Senate incumbents in the last 20 years. Uh, Landrew's going to hold on. Pryor's going to hold on. And the fact is the national trend trumped strong Democrats, even as they ran ahead of the national uh, ticket on the presidential level. And I suspect that's likelier to be true this time than people are willing to let on. Uh, the race that nobody's talked about that I think could be a little bit of a sleeper is Bill Nelson in Florida. He lucked out his past two reelections in 2006 and 2012 with having really subpar Republican candidates. Catherine Harris ran against him in 2006, and he crushed her. And in 2012, he crushed Connie Mack. But if Rick Scott were to get in the race, you have a real ball game with a guy who's been in Washington as a senator for the past 18 years. Um, he does have and has in the past had appeal to more moderate Republicans, but Rick Scott is fairly popular in Florida as well, so that might peel them off, and Bill Nelson could be in very serious trouble. I think one factor we haven't really recognized is that we saw Joe Manchin and Claire McCaskill, Heidi Heitkamp, and others early on in the Trump presidency going to the White House and sitting down with the president and talking about issues uh, to the extent they could. And the reaction from the further left regions of the Democratic Party were screaming bloody murder. It was, we have to primary them. Joe Manchin's really a Republican. Uh, he's betraying the progressive cause. And they're still talking about it, about primarying these senators. And that would be the worst thing to happen to them, because they're going to be beaten up and bloodied coming out of any sort of primary. We're seeing Dianne Feinstein, who I'm going to go out on a limb and say she's likely to get reelected, but she's being primaried from the left because she didn't, in the words of uh, the far left, resist enough. And that sort of mentality is exactly why uh, Jerry and I have always joked about how Democrats are very good at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. So if you look at what Democrats are doing for those races, and if they get involved and want to go further to the left and pull them to the left, you could see Republicans smiling and taking less value. Well, I'd love to keep talking about the Senate, but we only have so much time. So let's turn to the lower chamber of Congress, uh, the U.S. House. Uh, currently, the Republicans have a 240 to 194 advantage. There's a vacancy in Pennsylvania. It's a Republican-leaning seat. There's going to be a special election next year for it. Uh, assuming Republicans hold on to that, they'll still have the 241-194 advantage that they had coming out of the 2016 election. And that would mean that Democrats would have to win 24 net seats to take over the House. Um, and currently, at least in two polling averages, uh, Real Clear Politics, 538, uh, Democrats are ahead by at least 10 points on the generic ballot question, which is when pollsters ask voters or, or you know, respondents, uh, are, are you planning to vote for the Democrat or the Republican in your, in your district, or are, would you prefer to see Democrats or Republicans in control of, of the House? Um, there are a couple different ways of asking it, I guess. Um, and so, you know, that's a warning sign to Republicans, and so I'm curious to hear the panel's thoughts on how Republicans can change that political environment, or is it up to Trump to change that political environment, and are things bad enough they could lose the House, and you know, their general thoughts on the House at this point? Let me start with Senator By. Well, it's going to be a, a tough night for Republicans already, as we discussed in response to the first question. So I think right off the bat, out of the 24, they're losing, you know, 13, 14, 15. Uh, there's not a lot that can be done. I don't see how the president's going to dramatically improve his um, favorability rating. I don't see how they're going to deal with uh, suppressed Democratic uh, enthusiasm unless, as uh, the previous, uh, the other Evan mentioned, that we have multiple primaries breaking out, pulling our candidates to the left. Uh, so with regard to the, uh, so my advice, if, if, what can they do about it? Uh, don't uh, threaten to shut down the government. That would be number one. Don't threaten to default on the national debt. That would be number two. Stop trying to repeal and re re replace Obamacare because your efforts in that regard were, by the time the argument played itself out, only about 30 percent popular. Uh, and on this tax bill, it's going to cut both ways. Uh, the thing that will help the Republicans is there are some provisions in the tax bill to accelerate capital investment by businesses, allowing them to write off 100 percent of their investments 
and new plant equipment and expansion over the next five years. That may serve as a temporary boost and get us through the midterm. This uh, economic cycle is getting pretty long. Uh, the markets are fully valued. You'd think at some point in here we'd have economic softness. If this bill adds enough stimulus to get them through the midterm, that will help. But conversely, and particularly for the House, and I mentioned this before, doing away with the deductibility of state and local taxes is going to hammer uh, some of these suburban Republicans in New Jersey and New York and California, around Chicago, uh, possibly the one representative here in Virginia. Uh, uh, Comstock. Correct. So, I mean, they are literally lining up a number of their, even if they don't vote for it, they're going to be held responsible for it. And that may cost them a number of seats right there. So if I had to say today, I'd say short of 24, unless it's a complete wave, but so close that it makes the House just ungovernable. Poor Paul Ryan because of the Freedom Caucus. I mean, it'll be a mar margin of two, four, six votes, something like that, which makes it just ungovernable. That would be my, um, my ultimate uh, prediction on the House. Good night for Democrats, but given the maps, maybe not quite enough to get over the, over the hump. Yeah, so I would probably give Democrats at this point, given what we know now, a 75-ish percent ballpark chance of retaking the House. And the way that I process this is through sort of three indicators. First, generic ballot, second, retirements, and third, win rate. So in terms of the generic ballot, in 2006, uh, like I said earlier, Democrats won the House, by, uh, House popular vote by eight points. They're currently leading by 10 plus points. There have been changes in the map that have helped Republicans, uh, changes in you know voter coalitions as well. We can get into that more if we want to. But the map is tilted towards Republicans at this point. That being said, Democrats currently are have an increased lead over where they were in 2006 when they managed to take the House. I would guess that somewhere in the double digits would probably do the trick for them. Polls can move, um, but that's a little bit of where I'm at with the polls. In terms of retirements, this is actually one of the undercovered sort of stories of the battle for control of the House. If you look at the rate of Republican retirements from the House, it's outstripping some of these other midterms where Republicans have been or have fared poorly in the past. And incumbency does confer a real advantage. If you look at historical data, incumbents oftentimes do a few points better than non-incumbents. So when these uh, politicians retire, sometimes that advantage is lost. And then that threshold of generic ballot that you need to retake the House uh, sort of goes down a little bit if the opposing party to you is retiring. The third thing that I think about in terms of this is win rates. So there's a couple different ways to attack who's going to win the House and why. One thing that I did was I divided all of the 2016 districts up based on their partisan lean, which is how they voted on the presidential level compared to what the national environment was that year. I divided that for 2016, divided up for 2006, and basically asked how often do, uh, in 2006, did Democrats win districts that leaned two to four points to the right, four to six points to the right, two to four points to the left, so on and so forth. Applied all those numbers through and removed any blue dog Democrats that were there in really Republican districts. And if you do all that math, essentially what you come out to is Democrats winning a narrow majority if they perform in line with 2006. In terms of what President Trump could do, um, my best sort of two things that I would guess would be to uh, advocate for policies that poll better. Uh, the current health care or the health care replacement bills that have been um, proposed and haven't passed have not polled very well and have taken a toll on his approval rating. Um, and so if he can find a way to increase his approval rating, he, his approval rating increased slightly when he was seen as competently handling the hurricanes Harvey and Irma. Um, so if you can sort of improve that rating, then potentially Republicans would do better and also um, do anything he can to keep incumbents in vulnerable districts from retiring. Um, that would be sort of my things that President Trump might be able to do. Yeah, I, would, I agree with most of what's been said here. <clears throat> I think um, the retirements play a huge factor here. And if you look at not only the rate of retirement, but also the type of candidates retiring, um, a lot of them are people who came from uh, less partisan districts or more partisan, uh, more uh, middle um, districts. They're the people who are going to face uh, the toughest battle. And those are some of the ones who are um, 
choosing not to go through that. Um, those are go going to be harder uh, uh, districts for Republic a new Republican to go in and win. I also think it's really important to look at, you know, we talked earlier about uh, Virginia and what, um, how that, uh, uh, what we can learn from that for 2018. If we go back and we look at Karen Handel's race um, in Georgia, which none of us have talked about, those were huge races with tons and tons of money poured into them. And this special election in Alabama uh, um, for a different chamber, but uh, is also a very expensive race. But these are also um, occurring sort of on their own. And in 2018, you're going to have a much, uh, a much broader field of play. The money may be split up differently and people may be less focused nationally on some of these individual races. So I think if I had advice, one of the biggest things I would say is that more candidates need to go home now, spend more time. I mean, I know that's the old, that that's shouldn't be news to anybody in this room, but it is getting home and getting in their district and making sure that they have their own tribes built and that people support them regardless of what that national narrative is to fend off some of those, um, those big fights. I give uh, the Democrats about a two-thirds chance of retaking the House, uh, but I come at it a little bit differently than David does. Uh, I take a look at three types of House districts. One is the districts that Clinton carried, that Republicans hold. The second are districts that Trump won, but with less than 50 percent, uh, of which there's about 15 or 20. And then the third is the districts that voted for Obama, but then voted for Trump. Uh, if you take a look at you know the voter study group that I data that I suggested that have been borne out by the subsequent election returns, any Republican who is running in a district that Clinton carried should be extremely worried that these are exactly the sorts of districts and sorts of areas like Hempstead or like Westchester or like Northern Virginia uh, that voted up and down the ballot for Democrats in 2017. Um, I would venture that, uh, notwithstanding retirements, 80 to 90 percent of those people are going to be gone, uh, and that gets the Democrats almost to within. Then the question is, how many Democrats can Republicans can they switch uh, in the other seats? And then the question is, do traditional Democrats who voted for Obama twice and voted for Gore and voted for Kerry, the sort of person who came over and voted for Trump in eastern Ohio, in eastern Iowa, in northern Maine? Do enough of them get discouraged or go back home to their party to lose? That's the second group of districts. There's about 13 Democrats, Republicans, who hold those seats, and I think a number of those will fall as well. Then you've got the third group, where uh, the group we haven't talked about are the Republicans who, in the presidential race, voted for a third-party candidate. The slight indication we have is that they're beginning to split their ballot more down ballot as well. And the one seat that uh, was picked up by the Democrats that Clinton didn't carry in Northern Virginia was exactly that sort of seat, you know, that Trump carried it, but under 50 percent, and the Democrat prevailed narrowly. I would look very carefully at seats like Eric Paulson's seat in the suburban, in suburban Minnesota. Uh, Trump carried less than 50, uh, not Eric Paulson, um, Jason Lewis, uh, Trump carried, but less than 50 percent. Uh, uh, the o Omaha seat, you know, these are the places where a bad trend for Democrat or Republicans will show up in these light red districts. And uh, I think barring a massive change in sentiment, and the tax bill is not going to accomplish it because it hurts too many people uh, in the short term directly on their taxes, uh, I think that what you're going to see is probably a narrow five to ten seat uh, Democratic majority in the House at the end of the time. What can Trump do? Well, think about the North Korean missile crisis in mid-October. Nothing like a, there's nothing like a successful handling of a foreign crisis that rallies the nation in the short term. Um, I don't know if saying little rocket man is going to rocket Republicans up in the polls, but uh, it, Henry is right. I looked at the Cook political report uh, grading of all of the races, and 82 were considered competitive. 46 of them are truly competitive in that just slightly lean Republican or slightly lean Democrat or toss up. And that's a lot of races. So when you have that, and in combination with the thing that took a lot of people by surprise in Virginia, particularly in New York uh, last week, that uh, we saw all of those uh, these races that nobody had on their radars. I think there might be three or four races that just pop out of nowhere that will flip without people seeing it uh, beforehand. And then it'll make sense in hindsight. Uh, I think that 
one of the big factors for us as a Republican Party right now is whether or not we can govern. And we have not been able to do that. Right now, the only thing we have to hang our hats on in terms of results is uh, the new Supreme Court Justice, Justice Gorsuch. And that's only senators who can go back and do that. The House can't say it. The House can say, yes, we passed you know, the, the repeal and replacement of Obamacare, but that never became law. And they're probably going to pass tax reform today. But will that become law? And we, unless we can really effectively demonstrate to voters that we have the ability to govern, there are going to be a lot of Republicans who stay home because they say, you know, we trusted you. You had both chambers and the White House, and you could do nothing. I think that Donald Trump is actually providing cover because of his outsized personality for the fact that we have a governing problem that existed long before Trump was president. We have too many factions in the party. The Freedom Caucus, as Senator Bai mentioned, they uh, are unwilling to compromise on any aspects. It drove John Boehner into retirement, where he's now sort of laughing at everybody else having to deal with the problems of today because they're only getting worse. So when it comes to House races, when you have that energized Democratic base that's organizing on its own and really getting out there and finding ways to raise money and go around the DNC, which is in shambles, and Republicans getting more and more depressed, you're going to see that. I think that uh, there are plenty of Republicans who are actually exciting Republicans who offer a vision for the future, and Will Hurd in particular, but he's going to probably have a tough race. I think he will actually survive because he's managed to walk a very fine line and tightrope of how to deal with Trump and deal with other issues and be there like he cares and actually get back into the district and be involved in it. But I don't think there are many other Republicans who have been so successful. Those just, are, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. I just, just two quick points. So if, if my colleagues uh, on the panel are correct and the Democrats do get a narrow majority in the House, uh, the Senate will be so closely divided. There will basically be no room unless the president really does go full bipartisan on infrastructure or something like that. There will be no prospects for significant legislative action. And so in the House, you can look forward to two years of investigations all the time. I mean, it's going to be Benghazi on steroids only in reverse. And so all the Republican cabinet members and their staffs will need to lawyer up. And uh, it, so that's number one. You just These investigations will be going on all the time on the House side. And the other thing is I think it makes it more likely that Robert Mueller's um, investigation will uh, go to its conclusion because the House might view the President's removal of him as being an impeachable offense. Oh, I was just going to make a joke about the smart Aggies like Will Hurd. I was going to make a joke that I can't wait to see what Louise Linton wears to testifying before Congress. Uh, yeah, if anyone didn't see it, the, the wife of the Treasury Secretary, uh, who has created a stir, um, was captured in a picture holding a bunch of dollar bills up, freshly printed, I believe. And uh, anyway, it created a Twitter sensation um, if you didn't see it. So I think now um, we're going to move to Q&A. Uh, so I'm not sure where the mics are, uh, but I think they are probably back there. Um, and we'll, we'll get about 15 minutes of uh, Q&A, and then uh, we'll get set for the second panel. So, if, oh, we have a we have a question up here in the front. Um, we can get a microphone to him. So, one of the major assumptions in midterm elections is that the opposition party does very well. Some have said that President Trump and Republicans might not really be acting like they are the governing majority party right now. So, is Trump still, in a way, the opposition party? Could they run like that? Would that work, or would that just be self-sabotaging? Anyone have a response to that? I mean, what I would say about this is that empirically, we well, that a lot of presidencies over the last few decades have taken a lot of different strategies. Um, and the same thing tends to happen in midterms, with the exception of some very rare cases like 2002 in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks and 1998 when the whole Monica Lewinsky thing was unfolding. Um, <clears throat> so despite all the you know various strategies and tactics that different White Houses have taken, midterms tend to be referendums on the president and on his party. So 
I think that you can always, you know, empiricism always works until it doesn't, is what people say. And you can always have some election that breaks the pattern that happens in the future. But if we're using history as a guide, and if we're trying to be principled in that way, I think that, you know, we think that voters know Republicans are in charge, and they know what they think about President Trump and congressional Republicans and congressional Democrats, so on and so forth. And I haven't yet seen a reason in any of the data so far to suggest that 2018 is going to depart from that pattern. I mean, it could. We've got about a year until that happens. But so far, it seems to be that those normal rules of politics, while some other normal rules of politics don't apply, that those rules seem to right now. Any other thoughts? Uh, we can move to the next question right here. Number two. Oh, um, this um, one in the back at the, yeah, at right the moment. Here. Yes. If Roy Moore wins in Alabama, what is the probability that the Senate would refuse to seat him? I think they'd seat him, but they'd kick him out shortly thereafter. Uh, I think that they would, I think there's certainly a moment where there, this can be a defining moment and a positive for the Republican Party. We've been accused of having a war on women. It's part of why my generation doesn't want anything to do with the Republican Party. They view us as the party of the crusty old white guy and uh, serving our corporate overlords. Um, I think it's a moment where we can say, listen, what Roy Moore was accused of, in addition to his belief that we should criminalize homosexuality and that a Muslim shouldn't be able to serve in Congress because of their faith, that is not an American value and that's not a Republican value. So I think it could be turned into a win for the Republican Party if we got all of our members in the Senate to vote him out and expel him because he would become the 17th person ever expelled or 16th, pardon me, 15 others were, 14 of them were for their involvement in the Civil War. So I think that's a huge win for Republicans and a very strong message to send that we don't tolerate this type of behavior. Yeah. I don't it, think it would, they, it would also be brilliant by uh, Mitch McConnell and Cory Gardner because um, you'd send that message on the macro level, on the micro level, you'd remove more. The Republican governor would probably fill that seat with someone like Jeff Sessions. And so you'd have a... Uh, more cooperative member there who would uh, have a lot better chance of winning the next election. And, and it puts the Democrats in a position. It takes a super majority. It's either 60 or 66. We haven't, we haven't removed a senator in a long time, certainly not while I was there. But uh, how many Democrats are going to vote to not expel Roy Moore? So well, you can have a con confluence of interest here. Um, it could strategically be something they could leave and let hang on Republicans next. We elected them. We get them. True, but if you're worried about uh, the far left challenging you in a primary, boy, a uh, vote to keep more in the Senate would be a pretty tough vote. Yeah. Uh, I believe we have a question in the middle here. Yeah, we, we talked some somewhat about the, the burnout of dealing with everything that's going on with more and people just throwing up their hands, but are there quantitative numbers in the polling and all the, uh, about those people who are just going to go with the tribe versus people who are just not going to go and vote. Uh, anyone have thoughts? I mean, I think there's a couple ways to look at this. In terms of the burnout issue, one actually kind of interesting polling number that I ran into a few months back was, I think it was YouGov and the Huffington Post polled whether uh, people think that there's too much news and it's just so difficult to keep up and so on and so forth. A lot of Americans didn't feel that way. A lot of people are not as burnt out, are not as tuned in, are you know feeling a little bit more normal about the political environment than a lot of us who do things in this sphere for a living. Um, in terms of, excuse me, turnout differences and things like that, I would, uh, I guess, point to some of the special election results to show that in a lot of these places, Democrats are really energized, and a number of them, they're sort of turned up to 11 and want to vote in a referendum against Trump, so on and so forth. And if you look at the Virginia gubernatorial results, you see in some of the places in sort of the uh, southwestern part of the state where uh, Trump fared well and improved on Mitt Romney's margin, there was a little bit of a fall off in turnout. And um, I think, you know, other people have on the panel I've looked at the polls and sort of might have a similar or different assessment, but I think those are a couple useful data points. So, so the idea of um, throwing more under the bus uh, and, and in so doing gaining some uh, ground with millennials, 
how would the republican party do that and then still at the same time admit that the man at the top who has had similar behavior is somehow exempt? Uh, well, first of all, I would hope he was thrown under a school bus because that would just be fitting. But uh, <laughs> I, I, that is a very hard and tough thing to do. For, to the extent of my knowledge, there have been no accusations against President Trump, and I don't mean to rationalize and excuse anything that he's been accused of, but there have been no accusations against him of somebody who is underage. 14 is not the age of consent in any of the 50 states in the union. And if you look at what's been happening in the Republican Party before Roy Moore and what's, how only one in five millennials identify with the Republican ideals or conservative values, and that's at an all-time low for any generation, and then between December 2015 and March 2017, young Republicans, 18 to 29, 23 percent left the party. They're done. Uh, they're writing us off, and we have this demographic crisis coming. So I don't think that people are going to judge the party based upon how they could do that to Roy Moore but not to Donald Trump. They're already judging the party, and this is just at least a first step where we can at least try and earn the right to be heard by them, because we have to break through because we're being tuned out, and it's just, you know, party of the crusty old white guy, for lack of a better term. Do you have another question? Yeah, uh, you mentioned the economy a few times, and I'm wondering what you hear from polls and the electorate about their feeling on the economy now. It used to be the most important factor. Is it still as important? And if so, how is it playing today from what you can see? Anyone want to take a first shot at that? Um, trying to think of, um, okay. trying to think through Virginia. Um, I think that there, you mentioned um, that not everybody is feeling as caught up in some of the politics as we in this room might be. And so I do think people are looking at their pocketbooks and there are some good numbers there and there are things that are going to make them happy. And when people are happier with their pocketbooks, everything tends to work out better. So I do think that that still plays a factor. It will just depend on how much some of the, um, some of the scandal side of things makes people want to go and say, I get all that. I generally like even where you stand on the economy, but I have to do this on principle so I can tell my kids or something like that. Um, we'll just, I, I don't know that I can accurately predict that now, though. I think right now the most abundant renewable energy source in the entire world is anger, and that's what's going to be fueling uh, this election. And the economy is what's really keeping President Trump's numbers in the high 30s to mid 30s. If the economy goes, as the senator alluded to earlier, the bottom's going to fall out. And then you're going to see a real swath of anger across the country. And that's when it'll really come into play. That's all exactly right. There's a real uh, divergence between how people are feeling about their personal economic situation, which is finally improving with real wages at long last beginning to tick up, uh, growing a little faster than inflation, and how they view politics. Um, it, home values have finally recovered from the housing crisis. The stock market's within 1% of its uh, all-time high if you have 401ks. Unemployment's near you know, the lowest it's been in a decade. As I mentioned, real wages are going up. So people look at all that and they're feeling a little bit better about their personal economics, which as was mentioned, normally that's a pretty good predictor of how people vote. But they look at the politics, uh, the, starting with the president, Congress's job approval rating, both parties' approval rating, and they're just disgusted. And so my guess is that this may be a rare instance in which, although people are feeling you know, modestly positive about their personal economic situation, it's still a change election because they look at Washington in particular and they just want to keep voting for a change until they get the kind of change they're looking for. And this change has not been it. Are there any other questions? Oh, uh, here in the front. One thing I haven't heard addressed is the importance of the women's vote, the turnout in the most recent Virginia election, mm -hmm. and the proliferation of more women candidates. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you think that's going to have an impact on the upcoming elections. 100%. Um, I think that we saw it, and I think that goes back to the point I made about um, some of the politics, there are women who will just stand up and say, I get this, but I, um, I, I can't stand for some of these uh, candidates. 
Uh, uh, that speaks to still being a change election, people wanting to see something different, needing to make a point. They know that their vote counts. They know that they can um, can make a change. I also think that, you know, I referenced earlier uh, some of the frustration that even people on the left had with Hillary and how that was a bit of a drag. And I think that was with um, some of the women's issues and things that Republicans have played into and tried to push to build support for Republicans. Um, uh, I think I think that hurt her, some of that uh, drag on um, that she had depleted women's votes, and we'll see that bounce right back, and that will change some of those numbers. Um, I also think uh, women and right now millennials may have slightly different opinions of things like uh, health care and the economy. Millennials still aren't seeing some of those um, economic benefits yet, and women uh, uh, are more interested in education. Um, and a few of those other issues, which can then uh, uh, lead to a differing opinion. If you look at the Virginia exit polls and you divide uh, by gender and by education, what you find is that Northam versus Gillespie was pretty much like Clinton versus Trump among both sets of non-college people when, and women and among college-educated men. The place where Northam really gained was among college-educated women. So. When you talk about women, you have to distinguish between different demographic types of women. I do think it, you know, we've seen a lot of the anger and the resist crowd being driven by college-educated Democratic women. I think you saw that in the Democratic uh, victories in Virginia, is that college-educated women who might have been open to a Republican appeal are not, were not open to it in 2017. But again, you have to look at the different electorates. That in an area like a lot of these congressional districts where 18 percent of the people are college educated, uh, what you see as a women's vote won't appear because it's really a sub-slice of women. But in places like Barbara Comstock's district, uh, you know, that was a district that Hillary Clinton won with 52 percent, Northam won with 55 percent. Um, if I were Barbara Comstock, I would very seriously consider taking on Tim Kaine because she'll actually be running in a more Republican electorate. I saw, uh, I would add to what Henry just said, the one group of women that really turned out for Ralph Northam and did not for Hillary Clinton, African-American women. They really helped Ralph Northam uh, last week. Uh, I wrote in the New York Times in January that the Women's March was the most dangerous thing for Republicans because it was the equivalent of the Tea Party in 2010. Now, I'm not sure if that's still true because of the way the Women's March leadership has strung out and become so controversial, even among people on the left where the New York Times is criticizing them for extremism. But I think that the organization that has gone up there, that uh, when you have so many women who are, are proud to take part in this march across the country, and they're still proud. I still see the pink hats. Granted, I live in New York City, so that's clearly reflective of the national uh, political electorate. But uh, it, I, I think that there are a lot of people out there who are fired up, and they really feel that they want candidates who might not necessarily be women, but support women's rights, women's values, and can speak to the issues that are important to them. And they are really making their voices heard at the polls, and we saw it on uh, last week, and we're going to see it again in 2018. We have time for one more. Are there any others? Going once, going twice. Oh, no, we have another one. I have a second question. Um, Bob Goodlatte is retiring. It's a local race that I think is uh, interesting for everybody here. I wondered if the panel had any thoughts on why and what that, if that seat is safe uh, or if that's going to go over to the Democrats. It's uh, considered to be very safe. It was heavily for Trump, notwithstanding the exist, you know, the Democratic portions of the district. He was termed out as a committee chairman, and typically people who have gone from have been a committee chair uh, don't particularly want to go back to having no responsibility. So it was a completely normal and expected retirement. And if this is the sort of seat that goes Democratic, I think we're looking at a 70 or 80 percent, 80 seat. Uh, way because it was overwhelmingly for Trump, notwithstanding Albemarle County. Yeah, only one thing I'd add to that is that oftentimes uh, you see congressmen with two motivations for uh, leaving their seat. One is that they're in danger, and two is that it's not fun anymore. And I think that you're, and, some of these... And three is that they want to go to the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and so i think that that goes to henry's point is that some of these retirements in these really red districts might be just people who don't want to do the job rather than people who are in danger well with that i think we will move on to the second panel i want to thank our panelists it's, it's been great we can give a round of applause and next up will be my colleague kyle condick who is the managing editor of sabato's crystal ball uh, he will be directing the second panel which will be looking at donald trump's first year in office All right, I think we're uh, ready to get going here. Uh, my name is uh, Kyle Kondik. I am the uh, managing editor of uh, the Crystal Ball and also the uh, communications director uh, for the uh, Center for Politics. And um, this panel is going to look at uh, the first year of President Trump and sort of be a little bit more uh, <coughs> policy focused and sort of check in on uh, what the government has been up to under unified Republican control under uh, the uh, new president. Uh, and so we're going to jump right in, but first I want to um, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about our panelists. Um, on the left, we have uh, Ralph Byler, who's David Byler's twin brother. He, he's also really good at politics. No, I'm just kidding. David double dip for us, and we appreciate it. Uh, uh, David is with the Weekly Standard and uh, was formerly with Real Clear Politics and uh, is one of the sharpest uh, uh, minds in the country, I think, on, on, on elections and politics and all sorts of things. Uh, next is Katrina Pearson. Uh, she was the national spokeswoman for Donald Trump's presidential campaign. Uh, and she appeared frequently on, uh, on all sorts of news programs uh, currently and, and, of course, during uh, the election. She currently is the spokeswoman for America First Policies, a nonprofit that supports the president. Uh, Bakari Sellers is a, a CNN contributor uh, and a former Democratic state representative from South Carolina. Uh, he was also the party's 2014 nominee for lieutenant governor in South Carolina. Uh, he also has worked for uh, Congressman uh, Jim Clyburn uh, and former Atlanta Mayor uh, Shirley Franklin. And finally, Fred Barnes, a longtime friend of the Center for Politics, who's been on our panels many times before. Uh, he's the executive editor of the Weekly Standard and, more importantly, is Wahoo. <laughs> Bowl eligible this year. <laughs> um, so let's, um, let's jump right in. I think that one of the criticisms of the, of the president and the Republican Congress is that despite having a big majority in the House, sort of a narrow majority in the Senate, and also obviously control the presidency, that they don't necessarily have kind of a, a signature uh, achievement. You know, health care hasn't quite worked out. We'll see what happens with taxes. And um, I, I wanted to, I guess, start maybe with Katrina, and then others could, could jump in. Do you think that that's a fair criticism of the first year of this president and this Congress? No, I don't think that's a fair criticism. I think uh, having a Supreme Court justice uh, put in place is a, is a very significant achievement for a president in his first term, uh, not to mention maintaining his commitment to uh, withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership with, with regards to peeling back some of the regulations. I mean, this president, uh, given the fact that he has been fighting not just the media and the Democrats, but even some in his own party, I think for this first year, he's done exceptionally well so far. And I think moving forward, when we see tax reform and infrastructure, uh, we're going to be in a much different position. Do others want to chime in on that? You know, I think the most important thing that happened is good, what could, uh, for Trump is what Katrina has mentioned. And that is uh, the, uh, Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. But there is something behind that, and that is uh, how well Republicans are organized to fill uh, with conservative uh, judges uh, the federal appeals courts and the next uh, the Supreme Court nominee. Um, when there's a vacancy, which who knows when that will be. I happened to go to a uh, hearing on the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday and when there were two appeals court nominees, uh, both from Texas, uh, there to be questioned by the panel, uh, uh, the senators. What I was surprised at was how, uh, how uh, uh, unknowledgeable the Democratic senators were about these nominees. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be, it, with the United Democratic vote against a nominee, uh, it wouldn't take but a couple of Republicans to uh, uh, block them, um, and uh, and they didn't 
and they didn't seem to be up to speed about it. I mean, my test was, did I know more about uh, these two nominees than most of the Democratic senators did? And I, and I think I did, and I didn't have anybody doing research uh, for me. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I think the, uh, the biggest uh, thing, it, something that sure that uh, Trump has started this year is, is filling the, uh, the federal appeals courts and the Supreme Court uh, with conservatives uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. They are incredibly organized to produce that. You know, I'll, I'll chime in here. I think one of the reasons that most Democrats had trouble probably identifying who those appeals courts or federal judge nominees were is because not many people know of them. I, I will um, mention the name Brett Talley um, to you guys. Uh, you probably have never heard of Brett Talley before. Um, I haven't heard of Brett Talley before. The ABA found him to be unqualified. He was 36 years old, had only been practicing, actually had never tried a case, had only been practicing law for three years, and has been nominated to serve on the federal district court. And so to my colleagues in the Senate, the reason they probably didn't know about him is because we've only had six individuals who've been nominated for um, federal judgeships in the history of the United States of America that have been deemed unqualified by the ABA, three of which have been nominated by President Trump. But I, I'll back up and I'll say that if you look over and, and I don't blame Donald Trump. I think it's an unfair narrative to say that he has not been able to do anything in his first year. Um, the reason being is, is because I, I don't think that lies in the plate of the president alone. I think that just as my party and Democrats have trouble understanding what it means to be in the opposition and learning how to be an opposition party, uh, the Republican Party doesn't know how to govern. Um, we saw that in the health care bill. We, we see that now in tax reform. He does have an accomplishment with Neil Gorsuch, but just if we're fair with ourselves and we look at a fair comparison um, between the 44th and the 45th president of the United States, and you just examine something like the first 100 days, um, Donald Trump then and still has not accomplished anything legislatively. By contrast, uh, the 44th president of the United States passed the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which ensured equal pay. Um, he passed the stimulus package. Um, he actually reauthorized the CHIPS program. All of these are legislative, you know, conjunction, junction, how a bill becomes a law. This is like a true legislative accomplishment. Uh, this president, the 45th president, has failed to do so. I don't think that lies directly on his lap. I think that has a lot to do with the lack of ability for this United States con Congress to govern. Um, and we'll see what will happen, but I do think that as stalled as the United States Congress is today, it's not going to get much better. And I think that over the next year, going into 2018 elections, if we thought they weren't able to pass anything thus far, which is good for some of us, um, just wait till next year when it will um, be clogged up that much more. Well, I just wanted to, to add to what Bakari said, because you're right, uh, Obama did. Oh, we he, started he, off with an agreement. We did, <laughs> for once. We'll agree once here. Uh, but the difference between uh, the first 100 days of Barack Obama and uh, President Trump is there were 60 votes in the Senate. Um, and if that were the case with Republicans, I'm pretty sure you would have seen health care be taken care of by now. And there wouldn't be such a struggle with tax reform. Unfortunately, uh, the swamp is very deep and it is very slimy. And so the president is having to deal with uh, individuals who are having to please special interest groups and lobbying firms that pour large amounts of money into campaign coffers. So I would say that you can't really correlate the first 100 days between the two, uh, even though they have their parties in power, because there is that 60 vote threshold. Yeah, one thing that um, I would say on this question is that if you sort of just take it as written or as said, has Trump accomplished a you know major large scale bill uh, on par with the Affordable Care Act or something like that. I mean, the answer is no, but the, this all depends on where you set the bar and where you sort of, and how you're thinking about legislative accomplishments. I think that um, what Katrina and uh, Fred said about Neil Gorsuch is a fair point, that Donald Trump did deliver um, to part of his constituency, which is social conservatives in the form of a new judge, but yeah, the the sort of big ticket items haven't been there yet. And I think the point about 60 senators, 
um, is worthwhile. I would also point out that there are some Democratic votes that should, in theory, be gettable for Republicans, Democrats who would like to side with the Trump administration on some things because they're running in extremely red states. Those uh, votes just haven't crossed over on some of the main bills like the various attempts at repeal in place. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention something about our, our lineup uh, today. Uh, uh, originally, Simone Sanders, who's the Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, spokeswoman in the campaign, was going to be part of this panel, but um, she had some DNC commitments and had to cancel at the last minute, so I just um, wanted to mention that. Um, uh, you know, one thing that gets bandied about a lot about the president, and this was particularly came out when the president cut a little deal with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer over the debt ceiling, sort of kicking that to, to December uh, recently, is that uh, and you saw big stories like Peter Baker at the New York Times had a big story about this, and it appeared in other places that you know Donald Trump is sort of an independent in the presidency, and that he's not a you know a regular kind of uh, Republican. Uh, and I'm just I would interested to hear from from the panel, and anyone can start who would, who would like. Is do you agree with that, or is is this a person who is more um, more like a, a regular conservative Republican? I mean, how is he? How is he maybe different or not so different than if, say, Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush or uh, someone else was, was president? He has adopted most of the uh, conservative Republican agenda, not all of it, and he's added a couple things. Uh, certainly most Republicans don't agree with him on trade. Uh, more of them, but not all of them, uh, uh, agree with him on, on immigration, but uh, uh, and that's a, a complicated issue, a problematic issue for Republicans because they are, uh, they are divided on it. The you, know, you mentioned that thing, that vote on the on the debt limit. I think uh, in terms of Im, of intrinsic importance, it had practically none. But it it was more important uh, that Trump uh, reached over to Democrats and uh, and it wasn't a, a, a trade really. He just accepted their position. Uh, and, and we go from there, that he, you know, I think one of the things that uh, Republicans have to worry about is that Trump will, uh, will do more of that. And uh, I'm not predicting it, but it's quite possible because he's been, he's not a, he's certainly not a traditional Republican. Uh, and I remember it being explained to me by, over and over again by Newt Gingrich, who knows him quite well, that Donald Trump is not a conservative but he does hate political correctness, and he hates the left, the, the, the political left. And, um, and to a great extent, that puts him into agreement with a lot of Republicans. Yeah. I, uh, so in terms of whether President Trump would be different from a different Republican president, I think there, there are differences. Um, instinctively, I wonder whether a Marco Rubio or a Jeb Bush would have uh, tried the travel ban that happened early in the administration. I think that's a real difference. Um, another difference is also in terms of polling and favorability. If you compare, and I don't want to get too far ahead of our discussion because I'm sure we'll get into the polls later, but if you compare uh, Trump's overall polling numbers with where maybe they should be given a decent economy and given no you know, major foreign wars taking up all the news time every day, um, he's, he's a lot lower than where you might expect him to be. And some of that is on his handling of policy and, so, uh, and some of that is just sort of a personal dislike that people have for him. Um, you could argue it either way. Maybe you say, oh, you know, it's just the national environment and Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or whoever would also have just as bad poll numbers. Or you could argue it that there's something unique about Trump that uh, makes people dislike him and <laughs> therefore uh, he has low poll numbers. But the reason that these polls matter is because they factor into what House members and senators think they should and shouldn't support from the president. If the president is unpopular, then he's got less sway in Congress. If he's really popular, um, then he's got a greater ability to pass laws through. People are going to be more likely to sort of jump on the bandwagon, if you will. So I do think that you could make the case that there are real differences, even though some of the main policy area focuses in terms of tax cuts and repeal and replace uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, might be the same in a different Republican administration. Well, and I think that this is where it gets tricky because President Trump is probably never going to fit into any one box or label. Uh, particularly, you would have to define Republican and you would have to define conservative 
in order to see where he measures on that stick. Because if we're talking about, you know, Jeb Bush being your standard conservative Republican, then I know a lot of Republicans who don't consider themselves as Republicans. So when you look at that, if you, if you at least look at the Republican platform, uh, which is where I believe we should look at who is and who isn't being a good Republican. I think that's where you should start. And if that's the case, when we are talking about uh, illegal border crossings, when we are talking about uh, things that, that keep Americans safe and put American jobs first and, and negotiating free trade deals that are good for the United States, then the president is a very good Republican. At the same time, we're not going to be able moving forward to, to really put anyone into a box because there are many Americans right now who don't identify with either party. They are identifying with the person uh, running in a particular party that is best representing their needs and their values. And I think that's why you saw a lot of the blue states turn red. So I'm not sure that Donald Trump has a political compass. I don't think that Donald Trump throughout his history has been conservative or Republican. I mean, I think that he only became a Republican probably around, I don't know, 2014. I think that when you look at his quote unquote transformation on social issues, abortion, for example, um, I think if you look at uh, just being in New York, his, his past history, there's nothing about it that says that he is a conservative or a Republican. I think that he is governing, though, like uh, a kind of blast from the past. I think that, and we can talk about this later, but I'm of the belief that economic anxiety is proving itself to be a myth. Um, and a lot of the voters that we're talking about that flipped those blue states red um, were not voting out of some economic angst. They were voting out of cultural angst. And I think that the cultural anxiety uh, that Donald Trump tapped into uh, catapulted him to the White House. And I do think that uh, that is not something new that we've seen in the Republican Party, but instead it's kind of a, a blast from the past. With that being said, I think that legislatively and policy-wise, um, 15 of the 17 candidates for president of the United States probably are more conservative, would legislate and be a president that's more conservative than Donald Trump. Uh, the two that I'm thinking about, Donald Trump and, and Ted Cruz. Um, and I can honestly say that um, I think that many on the left would feel more comfortable with 15 of the 17. Well, can I just, I want to mention on the, the cultural anxiety that you spoke about. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at everything that was happening in the country and the fact that people uh, didn't feel like their children were going to have a better future than they did, and you have a candidate who is unapologetically patriotic and calling out both parties uh, for their own inconsistencies and going into those states and saying, we're going to bring back your jobs, we're going to end the war on coal, we're going to protect our country. That's vastly different than what any other candidate would say. So I'd say absolutely this was cultural. People want to keep their jobs. People want to maintain their livelihoods. They want to feel safe in their country, and they want their children to have a good future. So you're absolutely right. There was a, a cultural aspect there. No, I just think people confuse patriotism with prejudice, one, and two, coal lane coming back. Um, they just opened me, a coal mine in Pennsylvania in September. So I mean, it kind of did. You had to, you, you had, at some point, we like. And Democrats have to do a better job, too. I hope we get a chance to ask Tim Kaine shortly. Like, you have to begin to be honest and refreshingly honest with the American people. We have to prepare people for a new economy. We have to begin to train workers in science, technology, engineering, and math. We have to start moving people who were in coal and help them understand that they will have a place and invest in making sure that they will have a place in a new, in a new industry. There are more people in this country that work at Harris Teeters than work in coal plants. I mean, we have to be real about these conversations. And Democrats have been afraid to actually go to these places and have these conversations because Democrats rather have conversations in New York and L.A. than have conversations in West Virginia, which is why we lose races. No, it's because they want to import labor from other countries, and that's a problem for a lot of American citizens. And that is exactly why you saw the movement you saw. Let me, let me pick up uh, a thread here about, about sort of a, a cultural versus, you know, economic.
to make in terms of maybe voting motivations for, for people. And, you know, I, I wanted to sort of talk about policy, but, you know, the president obviously makes a lot of, of, of you know, maybe controversial statements about, you know, things not really related to policy necessarily, like, for instance, talking about um, NFL players kneeling during mm -hmm. uh, football games and, and sort of talking about, you know, kind of, I feel like it's kind of like a cultural conservatism issue. And uh, polling is sort of mixed on that particular issue. People seem to not like the players kneeling, but they also don't necessarily like the president weighing in on it. I, I'm wondering, and anyone can, can jump into this if, they, if they'd like, um, are these sorts of picking these cultural fights, be it with the NFL or be it in, in other ways, is that helpful to the president, hurtful to the president, doesn't matter? What, what do you think? Well, it depends on which one you cite. I think on the one about the NFL players, uh, clearly uh, President Trump won that. I haven't seen any much mixed polling on it. Uh, the, uh, the whole idea of, of uh, kneeling during the national anthem uh, at NFL games is uh, by and large not popular. Uh, and and uh, President Trump uh, seized on that issue. Um, and they are, I'm trying to think of others that he's uh, 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 seized on. Uh, they certainly help him with his base, uh, right. which I don't think he needs much help in. It <laughs> seems to be pretty uh, secure. It's not a majority in the country, but it's uh, it's a uh, uh, something that uh, uh, that he has that he will uh, will want to build on if he runs again uh, in in 2020, which I suspect he will. Um, and. Uh, and you know, right now, one of the reasons for his pop, his uh, lack of popularity, is that he doesn't have anybody to run against. It helps to have an opponent uh, that you can attack. And, and and the bottom line being, I'm better than that person. I would be a better president for you uh, than that person. The and uh, a Democrat, you know, I'm not I'm not a big fan, obviously, of the so-called resistance. Uh, and, it, and it really hasn't had much effect. I, I heard somebody, I think it was you, David, say, no, maybe it wasn't how important that women's march uh, was. I don't think it was very important at all. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it, it was just a lot of Democrats uh, there uh, who don't like Trump. Um, but uh, um, and I, uh, Trump is actually in pretty good shape, I think, under the circumstances of his low polling, uh, to have a strong re-election race in 2020, the question about um, the question about about Trump and uh, and and using these uh, cultural issues and particularly tweeting is, uh, except for his base, uh, there's so many disagreements with him. You know, I mean, I think Trump uh, policy-wise. Uh, it has been very strong and has been. There have been v very few uh, deviations from uh, a traditional conservative uh, position. Uh, but it, uh, the truth is, with his tweets, uh, there are two problems. One is uh, all other Republicans, no matter what they are, have to answer for them. That's why he's so difficult to deal with, with uh, so many uh, members of Congress. And people don't like them. You know, for uh, until very recently, I, I've defended Trump and tweets, uh, and they certainly worked in the campaign, uh, where he could get directly to a huge audience, millions and millions of people. They are not working now. Uh, they are angering people. Uh, I, I think the poll numbers get uh, much higher. People wanting him uh, to not tweet. Uh, I think most people think presidents don't tweet. You shouldn't tweet, that it's unpresidential. Uh, and uh, on, on the other hand, uh, President Trump has given no indication that he will stop uh, <laughs> uh, tweeting. By the way, at this uh, uh, judicial hearing before the Senate Judiciary uh, uh, Committee yesterday, one of the nominees from Texas has been a Texas Supreme Court uh, justice, and he tweets. A lot. And, <laughs> He's funny. He's pretty yeah, funny, funny, though, yeah. yeah. Don, Don, Willett. <laughs> Don Willett, yeah, Don Willett's like a great guy. He can be funny, uh, but then he gets into trouble uh, with some of his tweets. Um, his wife, uh, some of the members of the uh, uh, Judiciary Committee, uh, urged him to say uh, whether uh, they wanted him to say, I'll stop tweeting if I'm a federal appeals court judge. He wouldn't say that. Uh, I was amazed. 
uh, I mean, an appeals court judge is, uh, it, it is a very, very important post. And he's not going to give up tweeting for that. And that was an issue that Democrats jumped on, and, and they were right about that. Uh, I couldn't understand why he wouldn't say, I won't tweet. I don't know whether it will keep him from being uh, nominated or not, but uh, it'll be a close vote. Yeah, one question. I, mean, when, oh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean nominated. I meant, I meant confirmed. You confirmed, yeah. Yeah, one question I always uh, sort of think of when we're talking about whether Trump wins or loses, well, two questions actually I think of when Trump wins or loses uh, a cultural fight is, um, one, uh, what questions are you asking? Because if you look at some of these cultural fights, the NFL is a, uh, an example. When you ask the question in different ways, you get different responses from people. People have complicated attitudes about these things. And two, what exactly does Trump win or lose when he wins or loses a cultural fight? I don't want to get too far ahead of our discussion, but the question. things that seem to swing Trump's approval rating uh, have not often been these cultural things. They've been policy related or related to competency or the sort of things that usually move numbers for typical presidents. Um, when you know Trump gets into a cultural fight, uh, it doesn't necessarily help move a piece of legislation through Congress. So it's, I think, easy to get caught up in, uh, you know, what's Trump doing that's popular, unpopular? Is he on, you know, the side of the majority of Americans or not on issue A, B, C, or D? that's purely cultural, but I think it's important to zoom out there and also ask the question of, even if Trump didn't do these things, would he still be keeping his base? Um, my instinct on that is, for the most part, yes, but then that's a debatable point. Um, one, one quick point. Uh, you know, I think, it, I think it's fair to say that this White House is different from previous ones in that a lot of times the, the, the White House tries to have, I guess what PR people would call message discipline, meaning that you're trying to pass something, the president's out there talking just about that, the uh, you know, surrogates are out there talking just about that, and of course the president is often going off on tangents, kind of tweeting, tweeting about this or that. I'm wondering, you know, does, does that actually impede the president's ability to get things passed, be it on health care or this tax bill coming up? No, I think the president's decently, no, first of all, they don't have any message discipline. However, I think he is pretty consistent on one thing. I think there's a direct correlation between the Muslim ban, ending DACA, uh, pardoning Sheriff Jarapayo, Charlottesville, and Trump's base. I think there's a direct correlation there. And that's what I mean by these cultural wars. And I think that he is winning his base. And that base is 35% of America. And that base has not gone up or down, and it's going to be 35 percent of America in 2020. I get that. I think the president gets that. But I do think we have to understand that that, that again, is cultural, not as much economic. And so when he makes these plays, I mean, he, he may be winning these. And this is why I say that this is a – I mean, we're, we're, I think we're looking at it from the wrong frame. Outside of tweeting, Donald Trump is very much, in my opinion, 1968. I mean – Think about the fact that we're talking about the president talk, uh, criticizing or chastising, or to be, to be plain, I mean, he went to Alabama, he went to Alabama and called majority African American athletes sons of bitches for kneeling and protesting, right? And so when you think about that, I got it, when you think about that and you think about that in perspective, hmm, you have these athletes or these individuals who are protesting what they feel to be injustices, let's juxtapose that against when we've seen this before. 61% of Americans thought that the Montgomery bus boycotts were the wrong way to protest. 70% of Americans in Gallup polls thought that the March on Washington was a bad idea. And so when you think about these things and you think about where we are, I mean, yeah, he's winning these battles, but for many of us, it's like, so what? Like, there, there is a larger piece of so what that's going along with the, with, with the Donald Trump presidency. But then you drill down on it. And this is when I disagree with you about the Women's March. See, the Women's March, if it would have just been a march, I think the criticism that nothing came from it would have been fair. However, let's draw the line of what happened. After the Women's March, you've had more than 1,000 women in this country, liberal, progressive women, sign up to run for office. So what does that mean? That means in the most recent election that we've had in this country, you had women on ballots up and down. So now you have a progressive, African-American female mayor of Charlotte. You have the first 
transgender woman in the Virginia State, delegate, State House of Delegates. You have the first transgender woman that's on the Minneapolis uh, uh, City Council. You have an African-American statewide elected official here in Virginia. You have an African-American female who's the lieutenant governor of New Jersey. You're about to have an African-American woman who's the mayor of Atlanta. And so you're starting to see the results from what happens when you put women on the ballot up and down. And so we literally have now, this is what's astounding to me, not only did Democrats just win a few seats in Oklahoma, Oklahoma, for God's sake, but there is a black mayor in Helena, Montana. He is the first black mayor of any city in the history of Montana. And I think that there is a correlation that you can draw from that energy that you saw when progressives came together and marched and it was very layered and very intersectional because they were marching for everything. Now, there wasn't a common goal. I mean, people were just marching for everything. It was kind of like gathered and air out all your frustrations. But you're starting to see that in election victories. The question is, can the Democratic Party harness that, produce good candidates, and translate that into 2018? Now, that's still yet to be seen. Well, I, I don't think you can, you can have it both ways. I mean, you're insinuating that the president is racist and everybody that supported him is as well. No, 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 now, no, no, just, no, 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 no. Just the other day, Bakari, no, this I don't, week, I don't, no, 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 let's week, back up. Let me just clarify. I don't think that the president of the United States is racist. I think that's a harsh accusation, and I don't know the man's heart. Then why bring up the but, athlete? But, 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 I do think that he traffics in racism. Now, I think there's a clear difference between the two. To call somebody racist is very ballsy. I'm not doing that. But to, to actually use racism as a political currency to move people to vote for you, I think is, it, it means a lot. For example, Isn't I was that in what studio. what the left does every day? I was in studio with Donald Trump when he didn't remember who David Duke was, right? Does anybody remember what happened that Tuesday? Does anybody remember? It was the Mississippi primary, right? So if you're going to have a conversation about Confederate flags, that where they belong, and not remembering David Duke all of a sudden, not refusing to disavow before a Mississippi primary, I think that I can actually honestly make a criticism that you're not racist, but you're trafficking in some of those deep, dark things that we were hoping that we would move away from. So Hillary Clinton carrying hot sauce in her purse is not a racial suggestion either. The no, point if you is, read you a can't, biography, she's you been can't doing have it both ways. I mean, just this week, the president intervened on behalf of three athletes, three black athletes, and, and got them out of a lot of trouble in China. Uh, and with regards to this, this women's march, I mean, I mean, it's absurd to think that this was something that was planned by the Democrats in effort to thwart uh, the president's inauguration, when in fact, all of these women were in Washington, D.C., because they thought there was going to be the first woman president. And guess what? The hotel rooms were non-refundable. So they were going to be there anyway. And they decided, let's just capitalize on that. And that's exactly what happened. It's the unfortunate truth. It's, it's the unfortunate truth. You may not want to accept that, but that's what happened. So of course they were there, and they put on a show, and it was grand. But the fact remains, the reason there is a culture war is because the Democrats have been waging one for decades. Republicans can't say or do anything without being called racist, sexist, misogynist. It's been identity politics from the beginning, and it is failing now. So I would suggest moving away from that and getting back to the policies, talking about things like tax reform, talking about things like bringing jobs back to America, talking about things like it is patriotic to stand for the anthem, normal basic things that every person in this country has been dealing with forever. And that might be the past for some. But for many of us, those things are still, still near and dear and true to our hearts because we love our country, we love our families, and we want our families to be put first. Katrina, I'm going to take your advice and bring this back to policy. And I want to talk about this tax bill that is, I think, going to be voted on in a, in a few hours now or, or, or maybe right now. I don't know. Um, so, look, I mean, the last panel got into, uh, I think, the, the dangers for it, the presidential party and having an, an unpopular president as, as the president is right now, and we've heard from a lot of Republicans that uh, in order to keep uh, their base engaged and also to keep their donors engaged, they need to produce some sort of big piece of legislation. Maybe that's doing something with health care or on, on taxes, and actually the tax bill may eventually address health care and, and do away with the individual mandate, which is being talked about right now. Um, I guess the question I have for the, the panel is, 
Uh, what do you think of the prospects of this tax, tax reform bill actually passing? And if, so, if it does pass, what do you think the political effect is? Is that something that actually can help Republicans and the president, or is it, is it maybe uh, uh, hard, hard for that to happen? If the individual mandate or repealing that is in the tax bill, I don't see it passing. I mean, one of the things that you have to – I mean, anybody that's been in elected office before covers politics knows that the most valuable asset you have is math, right? Like, you have to be able to count. And so in the United States Senate, like, the job is to get the – well, Republicans need to get the 50, preferably 51, with the vice president of the United States. And so when you count that Ron Johnson's already know, you think about Collins and Murkowski, you think Corker has nothing to lose, Flake has nothing to lose, and John McCain's been a maverick since he got there. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult for uh, the Republican Party to pass this tax bill. Um, and then – you just talk about just some things that you shouldn't do. Um, whoever was uh, Secretary Mnuchin's staff yesterday, I don't know if anybody's seen that picture <laughs> of, of his wife and he looking at their first sheet of money that was printed mm. off from the U.S. Mint. Like, staff is supposed to jump in front of you and say, like, don't take this, <laughs> don't take this AP photo that's going to be blasted around the day before you vote on the tax bill, right? Uh, and so they're, they're just little nuances that the ship's not running as smooth as it should to pass legislation. But I think with the individual mandate or repealing that inside, although most Republicans want it, I think that's a death nail for the bill. No, I don't think so at all. And, uh, you know, I thought uh, Mnuchin has a very pretty wife. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, look, uh, tax bills are, are unique. I covered the tax Ronald Reagan's tax cut in 1981 and tax reform in 1986. All the reporting leading up to the votes on both of those was negative because you're not writing about all the people who were, all the Republicans who were for uh, the Reagan tax cut. You're told you, you're, you're reporting about, oh, here's a problem with this and the real estate community is upset about that and, and, and so on. And that's what all the stories are about, negative stories. Uh, legitimate reporting, I'm, uh, uh, for sure, and then – and they go up, and in 19 – particularly in 1986, uh, on tax reform, there was all, all this reporting uh, that, that led you to believe that this has – this tax reform bill has no chance of passing. That reporting went up right to the day it was enacted. <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, so, I mean, for instance, Ron Johnson, the senator from Wisconsin, who has said, uh, I, I'm against this. Um, I'm against this tax reform, uh, this tax cut and tax reform bill. He said that yesterday. Now, I don't think that's the last thing we're going to hear from him. I doubt it, too. Uh, I, I suspect he'll vote for uh, – they will uh, tweak a little uh, something in the bill, and he'll wind up voting for it. Um, so you really have to uh, – you have to take into account when you're thinking about the prospects of this tax cut and tax reform passing – uh, and, and that the reporting concentrates on on what are the uh, little flaps going on, uh, and uh, and but what you have to the more important is whether the uh, uh, that a tax cut bill has something for everybody as this bill does. Uh, I think it has a pretty good a pretty good chance of passing mainly because the Senate looks like despite Ron Johnson uh, it looks like it. Uh, it, it's going to do very well. Now, I don't know about Jeff Flake. Uh, he, he's voted for every conservative measure that's come along. He's obviously not a fan of Donald Trump. Um, but this one, I, 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 we won't know for a long time because the House it, it will probably pass a bill this week. It, it, uh, the Senate, I think, will pass a bill. But then you have a conference, and they have to get together. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic about it. Yeah. I have no idea if the tax bill is going to pass. But um, I do know from looking through a lot of the data on what's in the news and uh, what happens in the news at the times when Trump's polls go up and down and things along that line is that Trump often suffers if he pushes for policy that uh, doesn't poll very well, as the various health care repeal efforts did. Some of the polling I've seen on uh, the tax bill has also not been great. Um, I don't know enough about policy to take a firm stand on whether the tax bill is, you know, good or bad in kind of a normative sense. But um, right now, that opinion doesn't look good. Obviously, there's time to change it, and there's time before it passes or doesn't.
but that's just kind of an important thing for how does a tax bill figure in. If I would, like, when I look at home and I wonder how the, uh, when I'm at home and I look at the tax bill and I think how is this going to process, I look at the polling, I look at how it's playing amongst Republicans, um, I look at how the overall approval of it compares to Donald Trump's approval and try to process whether or not it's actually a popular bill. And that's kind of how I would think about how this is going to play out in the future. I'd say the early indications are that it's not that popular of a bill. Is that yeah. fair, fair to say? I mean, that's the polling I've seen so far. I mean, these things aren't necessarily static in the sense that, you know, maybe uh, Republicans or Democrats find a good message about it and are able to move public opinion around or something along those lines. But uh, yeah, Kyle's correct. The early polling on it. Can I ask uh, a question? Great. I was only two when Ronald Reagan passed the tax reform bill, so forgive me. But it was a great is year. this a tax cut bill? Or is this a tax reform bill? Uh, I think there's going to be more tax cutting than tax reform, but it'll have it'll have some of both. Uh, as some people have thought, uh, I happen to be one of them, uh, that Trump should, uh, should have just gone for a tax reform. cut. Oh. Uh, and, you know, with about three or four parts, you know, cutting the corporate tax uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, Republicans, uh, particularly Paul Ryan, have, have insisted on a, a bill they've talked about for a number of years that, that has a good bit of tax reform. In other words, uh, uh, killing a lot of expensive loopholes and special uh, preferences in the tax code. There are a lot of them. They, they build up over the years, and they built up like crazy since 1986, uh, the last time there was tax reform. So it, it is a little confusing because the uh, uh, there are both of these things in there, but it, I think the thing that's going to affect the economy uh, are the tax cuts. And the, and the reforms, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, they have a tendency when you're getting rid of these special tax breaks uh, to anger certain uh, groups, uh, the business groups in particular, um, and it takes a while for them to get over it. But they can't, I, I don't think they can block it in this case. Instead of the Women's March on Washington, it's the Lobbyist March on Washington, <laughs> the tax reform. That's right. Well, it is, and, and that's exactly what you're saying. And to Bakari's point, um, Fred's right. Uh, this is a little bit of both. Um, I think just doing tax cuts, I think it's probably a great way to go. Um, but as Fred mentioned, you know, it's, it's not Donald Trump that gets to write the legislation. Um, you have individuals who have been serving in Congress two, three decades who think that they know what's best. And so now we're having to deal with a lot of these special interest groups who've been dealing with these individuals for quite some time. Uh, the president has said he wanted to uh, relieve the middle class. He wants tax cuts for the middle class. He wants to lower the corporate tax rate, and he wants to simplify the tax code. That's the fundamental foundation of what President Trump wanted out of this bill. What we're going to see uh, at the end of the day, I'm not quite sure, uh, to my colleague's point over here, I, I don't know what it's going to look like. I do know that tax relief, period, is going to be good for the middle class, I think you know at least starting this process of reforming the tax code, whether it's through simplification or, or lowering corporate taxes, I think is all a good thing, not just for American families, but for the economy as a whole. Uh, I want to address a different policy item, and that is something that I, I thought was a real opportunity for the president, and may still be, and that would be um, some sort of big infrastructure bill, because of course you know the president is a real estate guy, you know, I could see him cutting ribbons and wearing a hard hat and stuff. I mean, I think politically that that might, that might actually um, be kind of, kind of a, a good thing for him. Is it, I feel like there's been rumblings that that might happen. Is, there, is, is that something that you think is on the agenda uh, coming up here you know, the, over the next few months? Doesn't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> he should have. So my theory is this, and I think that the president got bad advice from the Bannons and Millers of the world. I think this is when listening to a Mitch McConnell or Paul Ryan would have actually served the President of the United States very well. Coming out the box with a Muslim ban and repealing a place Obamacare, both of which have failed, was pretty bad ideas. Um, it shows you don't know much about the legislative process, and hence they both failed royally. If you come out with a proposal to infuse some dollars and reform the way we fund our infrastructure system in the United States of America, because every state, especially in the South, I'm from South Carolina, our roads and, roads and ridge, can't even get it out, roads and bridges are crumbling. We want to invest in high-speed rail. We want to do these things. What happens when you do that is you get a Joe Manchin. 
You get a Heidi Heitkamp. You get a Joe Donnelly. You get some, Republic, some Democrats who are more moderate to come across, and you actually put forth a piece of legislation that's good for the country. I think the last time we had Infrastructure Week, Charlottesville happened, and we ended up with both sides. So that's how messages get muddled. I mean, we start talking about everything else, and we don't even talk about it correctly. And infrastructure should have been done. He got sworn in on January 20th. I think it should have been done. And you can push more than one bill at a time. It should have been done on January 21st. And you would have gotten bi bipartisan support. You would have put Democrats in a box, proverbially. Well, I'm of the opinion that keeping a campaign promise is never a bad thing. Not if it doesn't uh, work. Well, of course. You, he made a promise to voters. I am going to, the first, my first day in office, I want a bill on my desk to repeal or replace Obamacare. Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell weren't ready for that. So he waited for them. And as you mentioned, it failed. But not because the president didn't keep his promise, but because Congress didn't make that their priority. And that's what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with people who are beholden to special interests. The, the people that are upset which is the American people, is why they voted for Donald Trump to begin with. Uh, he didn't know that after um, nearly a decade that all of the Republicans in the House and the Senate said we're going to repeal and replace. The House voted on it over, what, 75 times? They actually sent a repeal bill to President Obama, and suddenly President Trump can't seem to get it on his table? That's unacceptable. I don't think keeping that campaign promise was a bad thing because there was no way to know that the Republicans who had been campaigning on these issues for a very long time weren't prepared to deliver. Hopefully that will be rectified. At the same time, I do think you're going to see a strong infrastructure package coming. Uh, whether or not he should have led with that could possibly be debated or, or maybe not. But I do think these things are going to play out in the president's favor because he is – uh, someone who does have the interests of the people uh, in heart, not the special interest groups or uh, the mortgage firms or anyone else that we're hearing now surfacing uh, in Washington, D.C. And so uh, we're going to see more. It hasn't even been a year. And I think that expecting President Trump to solve all the world's problems in one year, I think it is just it's ridiculous. Well, I'm certainly not expecting that, but it was awfully naive of President Trump to think that a bill – uh, with a uh, that would outline not only uh, repealing Obamacare but replacing it with a full-fledged uh, health care bill on his desk the first day. That's a bit naive, uh, and it and uh, it it's been difficult. Look, Republicans have been very disappointing on the whole uh, repeal and replace thing, but one of the reasons is uh, they don't have the votes, particularly in the Senate. Remember, they found up that they wound up passing. They'll repeal and replace bill in the House. Uh, but the Senate, uh, the, the margins are, are uh, practically non-existent. Uh, uh, two or three Republicans defect out of 52, and they lose. And Trump blames, uh, uh, and, and a lot of his followers blame uh, Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell? Uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, one of the things I think Trump hasn't learned yet uh, – and maybe you'll disagree, but hasn't learned yet is that the way you negotiate real estate deals in New York City not how you it doesn't work in Washington. <laughs> now, why didn't he, for instance, call in, say, uh, uh, the senator from Alaska, uh, Murkowski. Yeah, Lisa Murkowski, and say, you know, uh, uh, Senator, uh, I've heard your uh, disagreements with uh, w w with the bill, and some of them are legitimate, and I certainly respect your position on this, but you know what? We need to get this passed, and we can deal with some of your problems when we uh, uh, have this uh, – the, the, uh, the bill on the – uh, on the floor when we get together after a, uh, there's been a conference and so on uh, between Republicans in the House and the Senate, but we need to pass this now. And – here's what I'm going to do for you if, if you vote for this. Not here's what I'm going to do to you uh, if you don't vote for this, but here's what I'm going to do for you. And that's the way you deal, and that's the way you uh, uh, win votes. Normally, uh, the president, I mean, there's a tradition in Washington that the president, when there is a very close vote and you only need to pick up one or two or three, the president can deliver them. Uh, and Trump didn't deliver them. Uh, and I'm not sure he tried the right way, uh, but uh, uh, blaming Mitch McConnell, uh, Mitch McConnell does not have the clout uh, and the influence that the President of the United States has. 
Well, I think, Fred, you've just uh, identified the disconnect between Washington uh, and people outside the Beltway. Uh, people don't want things to be done the way they've always been done. That's one of the Yeah, but they want why. them done. But that's why they elected <laughs> President Trump. And just because you pass a bill doesn't mean you're getting anything done. I mean, I know in Washington, D.C., governing is passing bills, which really isn't governing. But I will say that the naivete really was with voters. I mean, you, you're going to go and tell voters that, you know, you're Republicans that you've been voting for all this time – clearly had a bill written and sent it to the President of the United States, Barack Obama, but couldn't seem to manage that with a Republican president? That's not, that's all, just, that's that's not all the way that's, accurate. That's not, Republican, right. that's not accurate. Republicans have a number of times sent repeal bills to the President of the United States, just fundamentally repealing Obamacare. They did that 70 times. The problem that Republicans have when you go to the governing aspect is that for the last seven and a half, eight years, they don't know how to replace Obamacare. And so that's where the rubber meets the road. When you actually, it's one thing to say, I'm going to take away this. And then you're like, wait a minute. What are all these states going to do who've expanded Medicaid, who are getting these millions of dollars? What about the 26 million people who are actually getting, getting this uh, health care through these, uh, uh, not only receiving subsidies, but through exchanges, whether or not by the government or by their individual states? And so you're having trouble, and it wasn't just a blanket repeal. I mean, Republicans could have put, put, put a repeal bill on, the, on his desk the 20th or 21st, but replacing it has been the problem. And so I think that that just takes time, and I think that there is a way – Democrats aren't going to start from a premise of repealing and replacing. But I do think Democrats will work with you on fixing the Affordable Care Act, because there's not one Democrat out there who will tell you that the Affordable Care Act is perfect. Look, they've come around. I think you're wrong about Democrats and, and doing any – they've talked about fixing <laughs> Obamacare. They don't want to fix Ob Obamacare. They want one thing. More money. That's all they want. That's all they've talked about when they, with this uh, question of, of this money that was uh, improperly uh, appropriated by Obama to, uh, for a lot of subsidies uh, to buy Obamacare. Uh, and, that, and that's why nothing happened uh, with that bill. They wanted Republicans, uh, and, and Lamar Alexander of, Alex of, uh, of Tennessee was certainly for doing something. But who but did, who did he, who did he co sponsor a bill? With? Give us the money. Who did he co sponsor? Who did Lamar Alexander co sponsor a, 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 a ACA fix with? Yeah, but most. Patty of, Murray, a Democrat. And, and, <laughs> right? and, and that's only and that's only because that, that, that turned out to be only Lamar Alexander, and most Republicans were not uh, for that at all. Look, I've talked to Lamar Alexander wanna, about this. But you just said oh. she's with, she was there. Um, I don't necessarily want to break yeah, know, up this but, conversation, but, but I also want to. Democrats. We're going to take a few audience questions. <laughs> they offered nothing. So if they there are people said, who would like to money. ask questions, please do. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's fine. We were having our no, own I'm little... I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> we were having our own little bar. thing right here. Uh, Ma'am, go ahead. Hi. Um, I wanted to raise the issue of people voting for things that they don't really want to have happen just because they know that it wouldn't pass. Um, I recently moved here from Pennsylvania, and one of our senators is Patrick Toomey. Um, who, you know, I don't think Patrick Toomey is an evil man. Uh, you know, he has a wife, Actually, children, okay. grandchildren <laughs> maybe. But um, he voted strict party line. And I think when Ms. Pearson mentions that people voted um, uh, for Trump um, and, that, and, and that this is a mandate, I think... Um, unfor I, I think that people voted, did not believe that Trump would win. And I think they voted for him in the same way that Patrick Toomey votes against the um, Affordable Health Care Act and in favor of immigration. I, and I think they voted for Trump because they were annoyed, they're pissed, they're angry, and they just said, nobody. So we're going to vote for Trump, and they didn't think that he would win. And I think part of the reason that, um, and there's, and and I think that people do these kinds of things because they're used to not being accountable for their actions. And I guess, like, my question is that I think that all this comes down to um, whether we are a representative democracy or a direct democracy, and whether people are whether elected officials 
should vote their own opinions and their own beliefs or whether they are accountable to represent the views of their constituents. And along the same lines, so that's a, that's a question, is are we really a direct or a representative democracy? And the other question... Yeah, we know yeah, the me, answer me, to that. Wait, 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 because I've got one they, more comment. Ask a question, so, uh, and the, and the comment you, is, that, is that how viable is the two-party system, given this? How viable is it? Well, it's been around for a couple hundred years. That's pretty good. Uh, and uh, look, do we have uh, uh, the members of Congress or, or any elective body uh, have to find a, uh, uh, an, an agreement somehow, a compromise between their hardcore principles and what's passable? And with that, you have to uh, have a political party that sticks together. Look, the, the problem right now with Republicans is the party is splitting uh, along a number of lines. Uh, and uh, a, a direct democracy won't solve that. Uh, that will just end our system. Yeah. Uh, so these general issues, I think, are, are really interesting. I want to say two things about them. One is, at least the way that I process politics, is uh, a little bit different in terms of what presidents have mandates to do or don't have mandates to do. I don't really know that any president ever has a specific direct mandate. In every election, there are a ton of different issues, and sometimes people don't even vote on the issue. Sometimes people vote on, you know, uh, feeling about the social group or just maybe against what uh, the, a party that they think has done a bad job or has been incompetent, or maybe it's about issues, or it's about all sorts of different things. So I think that, you know, when we're having this discussion about President Trump was elected to do this, elected to do that, I think that's just a lot harder to grab out of the vote than uh, we all seem to think that it is. Uh, and I think that once politicians understand that, I think that helps them figure out uh, how to pass more popular things and uh, figure out what the best course of action is. And in terms of the two-party system, um, there's sort of two, I guess I would say, sides that I commonly hear about this. And I think one that's been fleshed out well uh, by other people here, by questioners, so on and so forth, is that there's a lot of animosity between the parties, the number of Republicans who hate Democrats and Democrats who hate Republicans and are voting simply to spite the other side uh, is rising. It's called negative partisanship. It's, it's a real thing. Uh, but the other thing about the two parties, I think Fred made the point pretty pithily, is that they've, they've been around for a couple hundred years. And when we have elections where the number one vote getter gets the seat, it just makes sense that you have two parties. If you have a third party, it's just hard for them to get to, you know, 40 or 50 percent or however much they'd need in a three-way contest. And eventually that party gets eaten by one of the two major ones anyways. So those are kind of some general frame of mind things I have around those questions, and uh, there was a lot there, but I'll, I'll let the other panelists do the rest, yeah. <laughs> well, first, the United States uh, is a republic with democratically elected representatives, not a democracy. Um, and the fact that the, <laughs> sorry, yes, it is true, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, so I think that's really important to keep in mind as well. Uh, I hear that thrown around a lot, that we're not a democracy, we're a republic, uh, which is why states want to do what states want to do. Um, but I will say that, that there are people voted for Trump because they did want him to win. They did think he was going to win. I was there. <laughs> I was in all of the swing states. We did uh, bus tours throughout uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina. There were Democrats coming up to us, many in tears, saying, help him. You have to help him. He has to win. We need Trump. So this notion that it was just some accident um, I will have to, to just say from experience, having been there through the entire ride from the very beginning, um, that that's just simply not the case. People voted for Donald Trump because they wanted him to win. I think we got the president we deserve. I think that you, uh, if, to answer your question, we need to start electing better people. I mean, if you want people to vote, right, vote the right way, then elect better people. I mean, I, I don't think you can blame that on the actual candidate who you put in office, I think the individual responsibility we all have is when we go into the voting booth. And if people want to go in there and, and treat it like a middle school exam and press CCCCC all the way down, then they need to treat that sacred right with more responsibility. So we got what we deserve and we're here now. 
So we have time for, what, two more questions? Is that right? That was a really cynical response. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Sorry. We don't have our, our code down. Hello. I appreciate everything that each of you are sharing with us today. I'm a stonemason in central Virginia for 34 years, and I wanted to share that the Women's March was a global event. It was not just in Washington, D.C. I was unable to go to Washington because of my mobility issues right now from Lyme disease. So I was at home and my boyfriend set up the TV for me to see London, all the different cities around our nation and around the world celebrating women and men coming together. My question to you all is what steps are possible for both parties to come together and speak calmly and efficiently to fix together the health care for insurance for all Americans. If parties can put the party lines aside and work together to help the citizens of our country to receive health care well and established without the money issues. That's my question. What do each of you think are the steps necessary for that? Thank you. Well, the first thing you have to have, and, and Democrats don't have right now, is a willingness to compromise. Uh, you have to give things up. Uh, and, and they've adopted a policy of, of uh, resistance. We're going to oppose everything uh, that uh, Trump does. If you take that attitude, uh, well, then you're not going to get anywhere. Well, what we're not going to do is repeal Obamacare. So that's my level of resistance. What we will do, if we want to start a discussion of compromise, is help you fix Obamacare. And so what that means is how do we stabilize these markets? How do we incentivize insurance companies to make sure that they're staying where you may have one insurer versus but I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm going to clap and cheer with Republicans while you strip away pre-existing conditions. I mean, that's just, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sit here and say that you're going to be able to put forth a bill and at the end of the day run, ram it through because you don't want to see, you don't want the American public to see the CBO score says that it takes away health insurance from 21 million people. I'm not going to do that. And so for me, I mean, we can start first with the commonality of how we're going to fix this problem. You asked a very specific question about a very specific policy. I'm going to back up and tell you that the reason that we're having this gridlock is because of the fact that we are gerrymandered to hell in the United States of America. And until we start having more competitive districts, you won't get people who have to work together. Right now, there's no, there's no incentive for somebody from Los Angeles to work with somebody who is from the most rural part of Virginia. There's just no incentive because they're going to play to their base and come back and get reelected year after year after year. And so we have to make sure that we have fair independent commissions that are drawing these lines so you're not just drawing these lines to save your own behind. Uh, I want to uh, just, uh, we're sort of kind of short on time, so just one more question. Please make it short. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I, okay. So there's been a lot of discussion about the threat that um, Republicans pass this uh, tax bill and people get cut out of it and that could you know, cause some problems. Um, what about if they don't pass it? Like, I've heard sort of a general sense that maybe people will donate less or people will get discouraged. Is that the main threat from not passing it? And on that note, like, if a year from now all that Republicans have to fall back on is we got Neil Gorsuch how long does that, how long will that last? Like, if that's all they can lean, lean on, then what happens? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that is one of the main sort of threats that if Republicans wouldn't pass something to please various different parts of its base that 
those parts wouldn't necessarily turn out, they wouldn't be energized, so on and so forth. And I think your point about Neil Gorsuch is a good one because that uh, goes to a very specific part of the base. It goes to um, Republicans who are socially conservative and who uh, might be you know, an originalist about the Constitution, whether or not they put it in exactly those terms. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's one of the main things. There's also the uh, possibility, and I haven't seen, this is, it's a hard thing to analyze and a hard thing to figure out in a principled, systematic way. Um, you could also argue that maybe not passing unpopular legislation is, you know, ends up being on the net better than passing unpopular legislation. But I think you've kind of mostly hit that nail. Well, I would say that, uh, you know, it is a great question. It's one that everyone's asking themselves today. But the president is in a unique position because what he can say being an outsider from the business world. He has come in as president of the United States and in good faith worked with the establishment, has talked to and worked with the establishment on both sides. So he has done that. So if these measures cannot get done or will not get done, then that just energizes not only himself, but everyone who voted for him, and Republicans and Democrats, uh, to go out there and replace those individuals that did not help him get it done. With that, I think we'll, we'll close and get ready for Senator Kane. So please thank our panel. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please have a seat. I know you have your lunches waiting and you will be able to get, I must say that the, the, the uh, lunch looked great. There were several of them, but you can't have them right now because we've got a very important speaker, and I want you to listen to him. This is particularly true of the students. See, the students have come now because it's lunchtime. Uh, they, they generally will show up for lunch, and I'm, I'm very pleased about that. But we also are very, very pleased to have with us uh, a, a special guest. Uh, I was given a choice. His office said, look, you can have him in person or you can have him uh, on the big screen. And I said, I want him larger than life because that's what he is. That was kind of a joke, but it's serious too. Uh, and we're talking, of course, about uh, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia. He was governor, he was lieutenant governor, well, he was mayor of Richmond to start out with, city councilman, then mayor, and then he became lieutenant governor, and then he was elected governor. And uh, then he had a tough race for the Senate, and he won handily in 2012. And then, as we all know, he was uh, chosen to be the Democratic vice presidential nominee in 2016. And I've heard a rumor, just a rumor, that he's running for re-election next year. Though you just never know for sure until they announce. Maybe he'll do that for us right now. I don't know if there are any reporters here, but we'll tell the press if he does something like that. But we are very pleased to have him. He's a great fellow. Uh, uh, he's dedicated to public life and to public policy. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to get to know him over the years. And uh, Senator Kane, I think I have delayed long enough. Well, they said you were getting ready, so I hope this will do it. And I hope you're at the other end. And welcome. There you are. Nice to see you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Larry. And um, I'm really happy to come and be a keynote. And uh, even to be larger than life, I wish I could be with you in person uh, because I think this is an important conversation to have. We have five votes today, and I, may, I might miss three votes for Larry Sabato, but I'm not sure I can miss five votes for Larry Sabato. So, <laughs> thank you, sir. Larry, thank you for including me today, and I will just say to everybody there, Larry is a real treasure for the, for, for the university, but also for the Commonwealth, somebody that we, we really value him, his commitment not only to promoting politics as a good and necessary thing, but also his tremendous commitment to teaching over the years is something I deeply, deeply admire. So it's good to be with you all. And what I want to do is talk a little bit about the political dynamic, maybe especially in the aftermath of the 2017 elections in Virginia last week, talk about the Senate, our national political dynamic, and then I'll open it up to take questions. Um, let me start with the story that has a Charlottesville connection. I was on the national ticket with Hillary Clinton. It, it it marred my perfect record. I was undefeated in presidential election, in, in, in any election. I think I was 9-0, and and it was my first loss, but, but at least we won Virginia, and at least we won the popular vote still. Obviously, while it was an amazing honor to be on the ticket, it was extremely disappointing. 
I went back to the Senate. I think I got back six days after the election, and there was a letter on my desk from a young eight-year-old in Charlottesville, and her name was Penelope. And this is what the letter was. It said, Dear Senator Kane, I'm really sorry that you're not vice president, but being senator is still important. <laughs> she then said, I've done, uh, you know, being senator is still important. She then said, can you help stop my classmates from being deported? So that's what an eight-year-old has to worry about now. Uh, the second paragraph of the letter said, I've done a drawing to give you motivation, and I'm going to hold up the drawing that she did for me. This was the drawing that Penelope did, and I don't know how well you can see this. Maybe I'll move it a little bit closer. Yeah. It is a drawing of a much younger Tim Kaine with a cape in a suit. The cape has a T on it, and she's written on the drawing, Be the Hero, obviously saying, try to be the hero for kids in my class who are dreamers or the children of dreamers who might be deported. Um, I have framed this and I keep it on my mantle in the Senate because it says something powerful to me about this moment in American political life. Uh, 66 million people who voted for Hillary Clinton are disappointed in the outcome of the race a year ago, but a subset of the disappointed are more than disappointed. They're personally afraid. They're worried about being deported. They're worried about being targeted because of their religion. They're worried about the sanctity of their marriage being unwound or their access to reproductive health care being denied. And so there's a lot of people who are worried, more than just disappointed, afraid. And my job in the Senate, in my own sort of motivational sense, has gotten even more important because I feel like I go into work every day trying to help people who are afraid. Um, a few things. I think the, the, the moment we're living in is a test of the Madisonian checks and balances that were put into the Constitution in Philadelphia 230 years ago. Um, that's really what's being tested. And all of the mechanisms that were put in place, the Article I branch, the Article Three branch, the judiciary, free press, uh, the role of governors, the right of the people to peacefully assemble and petition government for redress of grievances, all of these mechanisms are being tested to see if they have continuing power to check against an overreaching executive, which is what the framers of the Constitution were very worried about. They were creating a national government after a few years of not really having one. They were creating a strong executive, and they knew they needed that to create a national identity, but they were deeply worried that they might create a tyrant or a despot or a king. And so that's why they put these checks and mechanisms in place. And we're living through the moment where after 230 years, and we've been through other such moments in our nation's history, we're testing to see whether the protective mechanisms work. I actually think they're showing great, great signs of life. Uh, there's, there's been losses along the way and there will be more, but I think the system is being vindicated pretty well. I would say that to segue to my second point, life in the Senate, I would say the one aspect of the kind of Madisonian vision of checks and balances that is, is not necessarily completely uh, coming through with flying colors is the legislative branch. Um, and that's not just because of its activities under this president. And I think, and I've maintained for a long time, that the legislative branches of the Article I branch, it's supposed to be first among equals, but in many ways in the last numerous administrations, Democratic and Republican, and under Congresses of either party's leadership, the legislative branch has kind of become the Article Two and a Half branch. It reacts to the president rather than proactively charting a course for the country. So it's really on the legislative branch, and I would argue particularly the Senate. If if I'm right that we're living through a time that because of an overreaching executive tests our structures, the question is, will the Senate step up, step its game up, and and every day. You know, I'm seeing kind of, I, I'm trying to make sure that we do, but a little bit of mixed evidence about whether we, we will. There are at least two sort of existential threats we're grappling with in the Senate right now. I've been in three hearings this week where we are talking about the possibility of war on the Korean Peninsula, not as if it's an abstract hypothetical, but as if it's something that could really happen. And that's pretty frightening to be having those discussions. Uh, in Virginia, we are more connected to the nation's military mission than any other state. 
I'm the only senator that has a child in the military. My oldest son is a Marine infantry commander. And so when you get in the middle of these discussions that are fueled by North Korean uh, nuclear developments, that are fueled by President Trump's name calling and provocative tweeting at the North Korean leader, that are fueled by other things, a slashing of the State Department budget, a, a refusal so far for the White House to nominate an ambassador to South Korea, our most nervous ally in the world. We have an existential discussion going on right now here around our national security. North Korea isn't the only issue, but it's the most pressing. There's also a little bit of an existential uh, feeling around the halls because of the Mueller investigation into Russian interference in the American election in 2016 and whether folks who were part of the Trump campaign transition or administration were part of Certainly, there was public encouragement of that, even by the president. He encouraged publicly Russia to take such steps in open statements that he made in July of 2016. But was there more than public encouragement? Was there actual cooperation? That's what the Mueller investigation is, is, is going to get to the bottom of. And that has an existential feeling as well. Um, so as we're here in the halls of the Senate every day, even on days where it seems like not much is happening, there's always a sense that we could be tomorrow in the midst of one of the most important chapters in the life of the Article I branch in the country. And that feeling is very strong. The issue that we're grappling with now is tax reform. Glad to answer questions about it, but the majority, the Republican majority has decided, and I agree with them on this, we need to do tax reform for the first time since 1986, and we do. But instead of pursuing it in a bipartisan way, using the traditional committee structure, which are, are both Republican majority in both the House and the Senate. So there's no way the Dems can like roll the Republicans. They are using a, a fairly narrow procedural technique called budget reconciliation to see if they can pass tax reform just with Republican votes. And they're doing it in ways that they're including things like repeal of key aspects of Obamacare, strong partisan priorities, um, that, that basically say to the Democrats, even those of you that want to do tax reform, we're not interested in your votes, we're not interested in your ideas. We will see whether they can achieve that tax reform in a purely partisan way. It would be better for the country to do it in what we call regular order by putting it through the committees and allowing full debate, Democratic amendments, markups, and try to find something that can achieve some bipartisan support. Finally, just there's three tests on the table now for the Senate that I think uh, two tests that I think are pretty important in coming weeks and months. The first one is health care. After about 10 years of health care being completely partisan, there is a bipartisan health care bill that's called the Murray Alexander Bill, 12 Democrats, 12 Republicans, one independent. And I helped put it together as a member of the health committee that is bipartisan, that the CBO says would stabilize the individual insurance markets, would hold premiums down, would reduce the deficit. It would almost certainly get 75 or 80 votes if it were put up for a vote on the floor of the Senate, but we don't have a commitment from the leader, Senator McConnell, to actually allow it to have a vote. So it's an interesting question and a test for the Senate right now when we are finally having a work product on the table on health care, the most important thing in anybody's life in the biggest sector of the American economy, and it's bipartisan and brings the deficit down and has the support of virtually every external health care stakeholder, will the Senate be able to pass that or will the Senate not be able to? Um, and I'm proud to work with Republican colleagues on that bipartisan approach. The second issue that's a test for the body is Senator Flake, Jeff Flake of Arizona, Republican, and I, have pending before the Foreign Relations Committee a, uh, a revision of the current war authorization that's being used to justify military action by the United States against non-state terrorist groups all over the world. Um, it was passed three days after the 9-11 attack and is not particularly suited to the full extent of America's military actions right now, but Congress has been unwilling thus far to engage in a serious debate and revision of that war powers resolution. Senator Flake and I have put a bipartisan version on the table and finally, partly because of the mercurial nature of the president and partly because of the American public's surprise when they read about uh, American troops being killed in Niger and other places, there seems to be some forward motion on it. But 
This is a critical power of Congress. Congress has abdicated thus far. Will Congress, will the Senate take it seriously? We'll know more about that in the coming months. Item two, the Virginia elections, uh, the 2017 elections, and what explains the Democrats' very, very strong uh, performance. I'm sure Larry, who is, a, who is a superb analyst of you know polling numbers, has probably already talked about that or will talk going forward. But I basically think three things explain the results, and then I'll talk about what that votes for 2018 and then answer your questions. Um, three things explain why the Democrats did well. First, Virginia Democrats have turned this state around. We were one of the reddest states in the country, and, and we've now won 10 statewide elections in a row. We've won four of the last five governor's races and three of the last three presidential electoral vote sets in Virginia. Um, Virginia Democrats run on really bread and butter issues, on jobs, health care, and, and education. That's how we run our races. The other side might run on Confederate monuments or, or bashing immigrants. And Democrats in some other states don't necessarily run on the bread and butter issues, but we do run very core bread and butter type campaigns in Virginia. And running that way and then governing that way is one of the reasons that Virginia Democrats have done well and did well last week. Second, at least so far, uh, Virginia Democrats don't fight amongst each other. We don't, we don't divide horribly amongst each other. It was surreal campaigning around the state for Ralph Northam, Justin Fairfax, and Mark Herring, and trying to help us win, to see in the last week of the campaign, the National Democratic Party was erupting in a battle about the 2016 primary. Um, was it rigged or not? Was Donna Brazile going to replace Hillary Clinton and me as the ticket with somebody else? National Democrats were fighting amongst themselves about 2016 at the same time as Virginia Democrats were unified in trying to win. Some of you in the Charlottesville area probably know Tom Perriello pretty well personally. Tom ran a great campaign to, uh, in the primary to be governor. He lost to Ralph Northam. He not only got on board and endorsed Ralph, but then he took a really important part of the campaign, which was from June till November, helping all of our first time House challengers to run their races and run them well. And they succeeded beyond everybody's wild expectations. We did well because we worked together. The last reason that we did well was because President Trump is uniquely unpopular in Virginia and is unpopular around the country. And, and the unpopularity that led to strong Democratic turnout is of a very particular nature. It wasn't because people don't agree with President Trump's tax plan, for example, or don't agree with his you know, uh, thoughts about college affordability. What is unpopular about President Trump in Virginia and it was nowhere more obvious than in his non-response to the tragedy in Charlottesville in August, was his divisiveness. People do not appreciate a president of the United States again and again and again using divisive tactics, whether it's against immigrants or Muslims or NFL players or, or anybody else, but then being unwilling to call out white supremacists, neo-Nazis and neo-Confederates for what they are. And that divisiveness of President Trump, of course it energized anybody who felt like they were on the receiving end of it. If you were a new American or if you were a Muslim American, we saw a strong turnout by many, many people who felt like President Trump's divisiveness has been directed towards them. But we also saw a very, very strong turnout among young voters who passionately support equality and among college educated voters who don't think divisiveness is the right strategy, but thinks, uh, but think that a president should be bringing people together. So that that's how I sort of explain what happened in Virginia in 2017, and then that bodes uh, a lot. It, it indicates a lot going into 2018. Let me just conclude and say a word about 2018. I think, I think both parties have a challenge that they have to resolve in 2018 and going forward. Both parties do. The Republican challenge is: What do you do with President Trump? Um, he's not a Republican, hasn't been a Republican, but he now is and dominates the Republican Party. And so every Republican candidate and every Republican state party and the national party and national leaders have to grapple with this question of, do we embrace President Trump? Do we distance ourselves from President Trump? Do we try some straddle in between? Ed Gillespie, the Republican gubernatorial candidate, I would argue 
He tried to straddle. He refused to be seen with President Trump, but he tried to campaign like President Trump. That straddle didn't work out well, but I'm not so sure that either of the other options would have worked out any better for him. It was not an easy choice to make. But the challenge for the Republican Party in 2018 and 2020 is what what strategy do you adopt toward a President Trump, especially if his numbers continue to be very low? For the Democratic Party, our challenge, our main challenge is this. We're, we're a party that is remarkably unified on many issues, but we're still divided on economic messaging and on economic policy. I would say there's sort of two wings in the Democratic Party. There's a pro-growth wing that very much embraces that growing the economy should be the main goal and then has strategies for how to grow it, hopefully in a way where the growth is shared and the growth is sustainable. There's another wing of the party that believes um, that we should primarily be an economic regulator, that regulation and even redistribution should be the goal. And they have a lot of data that's very, very serious about income inequality and wealth gaps and <clears throat> all kinds of challenges, but they primarily approach the economy as something to be regulated rather than something to be grown. If the Democrats don't come up with a harmonized economic message, we're still going to win our share of races next year because the energy is strong for us and the antipathy toward the president is pretty um, significant right now. But we won't do as well as we can and we won't be as able to we won't be as able to govern the way we should if we don't um, really hash out our differences and come up with a more consensus position on the economy going forward. So <clears throat> you can hear I've got a little bit of a cold and that means it's a good time for me to stop talking and listen to some questions and answer them. So, Larry, thanks for having me today, and I'll look forward to taking some questions. Senator, we appreciate it so much, and, and uh, you give a better speech extemporaneously than most of us give with a script. So I, I thank you for that. And also, I got a note. You may have a cold, but I was watching carefully. Not one single time did you stumble around looking for a bottle of water. I'm not referring to anybody in particular, Senator, but I, I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but thank you, Senator. We're, we've got some questions for you, and uh, let's get the first one right now. Thank you, Senator Kane. You've, you've been standing up for us, and we appreciate it. I am concerned the analogy between the deck chairs and the Titanic we're not talking about the environment here. If we're moving around the economy but not looking at the base, the foundation of all of our lives, not just reds or blues, but the United States, I, I don't know how we can really go forward in a sustainable manner. Could you speak to that? Um, yes, I definitely, I definitely can. Look, I, don't, I, I think there's a false dichotomy that's pitched by some, um, your question does not get, get into this dichotomy, but that, you know, you can have economic growth or environmental protection, but you can't have both. And I, I strongly disagree with that dichotomy. So I think if Dems run on bread and butter issues, jobs, education, and healthcare, that's not to the exclusion of the environment. No, uh, strong pro-environmental policies are absolutely critical um, to a strong economy and they're absolutely critical to people's health. Um, and so I think, um, as a, just as a matter of pure politics, it's really important to talk about environmental issues. And I think it helps when we talk about them that we don't just talk about them in the standalone, but we connect them to economic growth the right way and the health of our, of our uh, both our population, but also of our communities. Um, you know, Ralph Northam, as an example, ran a, as a doctor, and he was very uh, strong on climate, and I know that he's been a battler around things like the Chesapeake Bay and river cleanliness in Virginia coming up in eastern Virginia and on the eastern shore and in Hampton Roads. And so he had a good environmental platform, and groups like the Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters endorsed him for that reason. So I do agree with you that these are issues where we should not just be defending bad stuff, but affirmatively promoting good stuff. States are staying in the Paris Climate Accord, for example, even when the president's pulling out of it. I think we make our case on these environmental issues even stronger if we link them to the economy and to health care. Second question. We are in the 
in the uh, 2016 election, uh, the Democrats pulled almost nothing in the rural areas of, of this country. And even in the victory uh, in Virginia, just now passing, um, we have uh, almost no democratic strength in the rural parts of Virginia. What do you view as the as the work that uh, um, the Democratic Party can do to build better bridges with the with rural voters in in the United States and and also on the farm issues that are important to some of those voters and and secondly let me ask uh, I was listening to Glenn Beck this morning and he, he had a guest on who is projecting an economic crash in in December or January time frame. And so this adds to our uh, the stresses that we're going to be facing. Yeah. And already that's being felt in, in rural parts of America because of uh, the farm situation. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Democrats did horribly in rural America in 2016. And, you know, despite some real earnest effort um, by the Northam campaign, and I did a lot of campaigning in rural Virginia for the ticket and for local candidates, um, we did not do well. Now, the full picture of Virginia is Democrats have done worse and worse in, in rural Virginia, which right now rural Virginia is about 15 percent of the population. <clears throat> and Democrats have done better and better in suburban Virginia, which is about 65 percent of the population. So. It's been an unusual kind of dynamic in Virginia where we've been going from red to blue, but it's largely been, well, almost completely been on the strength of doing better and better in the suburbs, even as our rural vote share declines. So look, I think that there's two things you gotta do. Um, I think you have to have realistic expectations about how, how well you're able to do. I, if I, I, I'm gonna do work really hard in rural Virginia next year in my reelection, but I don't think my expectations should be unrealistic. You have to do two things. You have to put policies on the table that really connect with the issues that rural voters are concerned about. Declining economic opportunity, loss of health care in their communities. We have rural communities where hospitals are closing, largely because the state chose not to expand Medicaid. So we need to put some policies on the table that are about economic opportunity and health care. The health safety net are really important. Education as well. But then secondly, there's no excuse for not showing up. I mean, Joe Manchin, my friend from West Virginia, always says, they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. If you have the right policies, but you're not there actually making the case, they're not gonna believe you. Um, so what you need to do is have the right policies and then go there to make the case. And I think if we do that over time, we can start to win votes back. I do know that many voters and certainly leaders in rural Virginia are start, starting to be pretty skeptical about the Trump administration because they made a lot of promises, but then the Trump administration eliminates in their budget the Appalachian Regional Commission and slashes funding to the Department of Agriculture. Many of the core pillars of support for rural communities, the Trump administration is weakening, not strengthening. And I think some are realizing that they may have been sold a bill of goods, but we, gotta, we can't make that case from far away. We have to be there making the case in person. Next question. Hello, Senator. Um, my question is in regard to the impact on presidential appointments. And uh, could you comment on that impact, how uh, the, the current Senate process for confirmation is going? <clears throat> and um, uh, do you foresee uh, additional appointments um, uh, in the president's cabinet uh, in uh, uh, some of these agencies where they're currently lacking and have been for the past several months? Um, very good question. So the president's team, uh, first, since I've been in the Senate, the appointment process has changed. It used to take 60 votes to get confirmed. The Democrats, when we were in majority, changed that process to 51 votes for anyone but a Supreme Court justice. The Republicans, not surprisingly, then changed that for Supreme Court justices. So now you can get confirmed with 51 votes. Sometimes it can take time. But if you can get 51 votes, you can get confirmed. And I actually, I think that's the right rule. That was the rule that I had to follow when I was governor. Confirmations were done by majority vote, not supermajority. Uh, I think the election of an executive carries with it a mandate to assemble a team. And I don't think 
supermajority voting uh, in the Senate should block you from assembling a team. Um, that said, with the 51 vote majority, um, there have been some people appointed to positions that I strongly oppose. Uh, but I still think as a system, the president deserves to have a team in place, and that's why I support the 51 vote rule. But you raise an interesting point. This administration has actually been very slow in forwarding appointments to us. So they had the ability to essentially get anybody through with 51 votes, but huge chunks of appointees, especially in the State Department, the White House has not forwarded nominees to us, and there's some other agencies as well. Um, Sometimes a new administration, it takes them a while to get their personnel operation up and running. But I actually think it's a little more than that. I think this administration really wants to micromanage everything from the White House. Steve Bannon uh, famously talked about how they want to destroy the administrative state. And I think leaving a number of positions vacant is a way of trying to carry out that sort of theoretical goal. But many of these positions are really critical. And when you don't have an ambassador to South Korea, for example, when Korea is under an existential threat every day, um, it sends a message to South Korea that the United States doesn't value the relationship. So I think um, the slow pace of White House nominations um, is maybe out of, a, is a, out of a thought that they can weaken the administrative state by doing so, but they can't do that without also weakening um, Americans' abilities to either enjoy services from their government or project what we need to project around the world. And Larry, I'm, we're in the middle of a vote, so I have time for, I think, one more question. Okay, this is going to be a good one, Senator. Who's going to give it? And we'll cut you off if it isn't good, because I promised. Who is it? Go well, well, Senator, um, this is Jeff Skelly with the Center for Politics, and hey, this Jeff. has nothing to do with Virginia, but I was curious about your thoughts on the Alabama Senate race, uh, given given the hubbub down there. Yeah, well, it's it's obviously highly contentious and controversial. You look, I think Alabamans should defeat Roy Moore and elect Doug Jones. Bottom line, I Doug Jones, my. Um, is the Democratic nominee is a longtime friend. I've known him since the early 2000s, um, and he would be a fine U.S. senator. Um, the the activity that uh, Judge Moore has been uh, charged with, which to me is just completely credible, and, and it's only made more credible whenever every time he he or a spokesperson of his opens his mouth. These charges, I think, are really disqualifying, and so I think the uh, the voters should elect a, somebody they can be proud of rather than somebody who will embarrass the state. Hey, and with that, Larry, thank you so much. And I hope, I know you're going to have great panels this afternoon. I wish I could listen into those, but I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thank you so much, Senator. Great job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, that was that was fun, and you know I had I learned things about Tim Kaine every time. He's a very bright guy, has a lot of abilities. I had no idea he was a ventriloquist. Often, you know, his mouth wouldn't move, but you could hear him clearly. You know, so I thought that was very very impressive. Now I am delighted to tell you there is such a thing as a free lunch. Actually, you've earned it by being here. Well, not everybody. Uh, but uh, most of you have earned it, and we have a wide selection. Please grab one, come back to your seats, because we've got a terrific presentation from pollster Glenn Bolger and a terrific concluding panel.